Hello, welcome to Mind Chat. My name is Philip Goff. Hello, welcome. My name is Keith Frankish. Hello, Keith. How are you today? I'm okay. Uh, still a little under the weather after the, my uh, brush with COVID earlier in the year, but uh, yes, I'm looking forward to this. Oh, I'm sorry. You're still suffering. You're still suffering the after effects. I'm tired. Very do you, tired. Do you think you have long COVID? I don't know. Maybe longish COVID. I don't know. Oh, dear. But I'm okay. okay. I'm always invigorated when it comes to mind chat. <laughs> Very good. Well, I'm I'm finally finished my grading. Right, Got so my uh, grant application in to try and get some money to find out if the universe is conscious. Excellent. So yeah. just got a summer of I'll writing now. Sorry? How long will it take to find out if the universe is conscious, do you reckon? Uh, three years. Three years? Yeah. That's but well, I won't be spending... Years. You know, all the time, all that time, mm. finding out if the universe is conscious. I get, you know, just just part of the year. So oh, yeah, part, part of the year. Mm. yes. So yes. I'm looking forward to. Justice. Well, I, I hope you do. It'll be it'll be uh, very interesting to find out. It'd just be good to settle it. I think, wouldn't it? Yes. One way or another, you know, and just get, you know, move yeah. on. Move on. Yeah, exactly. So climax of season two. Mm -hmm. Have you got the explosions ready? Oh, for when we do live and let die, you mean? Yes. Don't worry. Got it all prepared. Yes, don't as worry. The, I, 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 everything's ready. Yeah. For as the, the special the effects up. guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Very good. Something to look forward to. So, yes. And then I, we need to get... So, we're going to have a summer break. If people can bear to be with my, without mind chat. And then um, I guess we'll... And we're, But we're some... already making plans for Series 3, aren't we? Are we? <laughs> I right. thought you were doing it. Oh yes, nearly there. We've got some great explosions. ideas. We've, uh, we, um, we'll we can we can tease people with announcements. We we could do tr teaser trailers over the summer about what's coming. It's an idea, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. I don't think anyone's interested. Really, <laughs> maybe don't they are. Tell yourself down. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> um. Anyway. In the meantime, I forgot to say last time, if you like this incredible, important content, please do subscribe to the channel, subscribe to the podcast, like the video, comment, write us a five-star review, and so on, to get these important conversations out to change the world. Um, you want to know who we've got today? Who have we got today, Philip? I'm dying to know. Exciting, isn't it? It is. For our climax of season two, we have got the amazing Angela Mendelevici. Wow! Who Wonderful. is an uh, associate professor in philosophy at uh, University of Western Ontario and a prominent proponent of the phenomenal intentionality theory, which is uh, kind of the view that... Um, consciousness is at the foundation of the mind that thought and understanding and all mental representation is is ultimately grounded in in consciousness does that sound good keith that sound the kind of thing kind of up your street well uh it's certainly an interesting view and it's a view that's increasing in popularity i think recently it is indeed uh, probably quite because it's true but i'm certainly interested to hear about it and also as it happens, not going to be our main focus today, but also as it happens, Angela is a panpsychist. So I'm hoping we finally get someone on who disagrees with you. We got to try to get all these guests on who are going to agree. And then it always ends up like, oh, actually, Keith, we we kind of think the same thing. And so I'm, this I'm is hoping... the one where you're really going up on me, is it? That's right. That's right. I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> But You've been waiting for this, haven't you? You've if we don't waiting. this time, I'm, I'm going to lose the will to live and I'm just going to cry all it. summer. Come on, let's talk to Angela. Okay. Should we bring her in? Yes. Hello, Angela. You're muted. Welcome to Hi. my chat. Hello. Hello <laughs> Thanks for having me here. Thanks Good for coming life. on. Are you well today? Yeah, well enough. <laughs> how, how are you? <laughs> I'm not too bad. Keith's not feeling great, are you? Unfortunately, uh, I'm I, I'm I'm always feeling great when I'm doing mind chat. So, Angela, thanks 
thanks for joining us. It's great to have you here. Um, as you heard, this is going to be the one where, where I'm outnumbered, but I'm really excited to hear about what you're doing because I know it's important stuff. Um, could we begin just with just by um, uh, you're telling us a little bit about yourself. Um, we, we, I always like to ask people uh, who are doing this kind of stuff how they got into, uh, well, how they got into philosophy generally and how they got into studying to thinking about the mind and consciousness and intentionality. Um, what's 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 your uh, your origin story of your of you as a as a philosopher of mind and intentionality? Right. Well, I started off um, as a uh, doing a management degree um, in undergrad, um, but I didn't take a single course. I was uh, turned away from it at the orientation session, and I kind of floated around directionless until um, I took some philosophy courses and I was like, this is really interesting. I got really interested in the problem of consciousness uh, because it seemed like the, at the time, it seemed like the one, the one problem that was genuinely a mystery and that we had no idea how to solve it. Um, at that point, I was kind of an intuitive physicalist um, of some sort. And I was reading all these books, trying to figure out, you know, what's the physical basis of consciousness, books with titles like Consciousness Explained, um, then it's a book and uh, and other similar titles, which um, it turns out don't explain consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, I read Chalmers, David Chalmers, uh, The Conscious Mind. And I was like, that is the final word of the matter. Now nobody needs to work on consciousness anymore. Um, I don't agree with that anymore, but uh, that's what I felt at that point. Um, and so I thought I should work on something else, something that doesn't have to do with consciousness. So I decided to turn to intentionality, the aboutness of mental states. But unfortunately, it turns out that that also has to do with consciousness. So that's how I kind of ended up where I was. I was trying to make, you know, I spent a lot of, a lot of time trying to make um, physicalist theories of intentionality work. Um, so I was kind of taken up by this, this spirit, I guess, that, that, um, that, that was pervasive at the time um, in the early 2000s, but also before then, um, that uh, we can study intentionality, the aboutness of mental states without worrying about consciousness. We can kind of like quarantine the problem of consciousness and not have to worry about it. Um, and uh, it really seemed that we couldn't make that work. And then I turned back to consciousness and um, decided we need to bring consciousness back in. Um, and in fact, that that's basically the main ingredient that we need for a theory of intentionality. And I also became a panpsychist, so I guess I think it's all consciousness doing stuff. <laughs> so you're just you're finding consciousness more and more central uh, to the mind and to reality itself. That's right. The heart of everything. Wow. We should have called this episode "Consciousness, Consciousness, Consciousness" or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so let's. I mean, a lot of people might not be familiar with this word intentionality so we've got the phenomenon it's the you defend the phenomenal intentionality theory and phenomenal i guess is just a, a sort of synonym for consciousness subjective experience what it's like to be a person uh but we talk about that a lot but intentionality is a word always annoys me because people always students or the general public always think it's to do with intentions or something where it, it's not necessarily is it so we can you introduce this term intentionality, please? Yeah, yeah. So, so consciousness by, by phenomenal, I mean like phenomenal consciousness. So like, as you said, um, intentionality as a first pass is the aboutness of mental states. So, uh, so for example, right now you might be having some perceptual experiences of a computer monitor, some colors and shapes um, on your screen. Uh, maybe you even wanna say that you perceive uh, Philip and Keith's face and my face. Um, maybe you even want to say you perceive people. So open question exactly what you want to say that we perceptually experience. But we do have these experiences that uh, these perceptual states that seem to say something about the world. They, they say that there's a screen in front of you. There are colors and shapes in front of you. Um, we also have thoughts um, that seem to say something about the world. So right now you might be thinking, oh, that's what intentionality is, or you know, I wonder if I think this view is true or not, or this is totally false, or whatever. You might be having all these thoughts. Um, these mental states also seem to be of or about something. They say something about the world. So 
this phenomenon that we notice in these cases, kind of everyday mundane cases, that is what um, what I want to call intentionality. Right. So, so that mental that, mental yeah. states that are uh, about reality. If I'm looking at the table, in some sense, my visual experience is about the table. If I'm thinking about the Queen of England, all my this is all the bloody monarchy stuff with the Jubilee recently. I keep getting all my examples come up with the Queen. If I'm thinking about the Queen anyway, my thought is it seems to be in some sense about the Queen. So whenever our thoughts are about something that's that's uh, I guess some people might think isn't that just consciousness isn't all are there are there are there, po are there exp examples of conscious experiences that don't exhibit intentionality that aren't about anything so I would agree with those people who think it's just consciousness but, um, but I don't think that's uh, that's a conceptual truth so we have different concepts of phenomenal consciousness like the the, the felt, you know, what it's like aspect of experience and intentionality, the aboutness of mental states. So we have different concepts and it's a substantive, you know, substantive discovery, um, if it's true, that they amount to the same thing or that one is grounded in the other. Um, could there be experiences that are not intentional? So some people think there could be, some people think there couldn't, some people think, um, for example, moods or emotions or pains, um, have a phenomenal uh, character. There's something that it's like to have these experiences, but they don't represent anything. I happen to disagree with that. So I'm also what you would call a representationalist. So somebody who thinks that, um, that uh, um, I mean, there are different ways to define the view, but I guess for our purposes, just somebody who denies that there are any phenomenal characters that are not uh, identical to or grounded in intentional contents. Right. Okay. So some people think like, sorry, oh, sorry neutral on. Um, it's it's not for the purposes of Pitt. So a, an advocate of Pitt doesn't have to be a representationalist. So they can still think that there could be pains or whatever that aren't intentional. Right. Okay. Brilliant. That's good. So Pitt stands for phenomenal intentionality theory, and we're going to get into this in more detail. But the basic idea is that intentionality, the aboutness of mental states is rooted in or grounded in or arises from consciousness. And then your point is so someone could think that, but also think some conscious states don't, are not about anything. You might think a, a feeling of anxiety is just a feeling. It's not about anything. Philosophers sometimes call these raw feels, don't they, that are not about anything. You happen to think all, all conscious states are about something but that's not an essential part of pit or phenomenal intentionality theory right it's just that's right a, have i understood that right brilliant yeah, yeah. I can it. i just also point out because i'm seeing some comments um in the chat um that the way that i want to think about intentionality is really neutral on the nature of intentionality so it's neutral on whether intentionality does in fact connect us with the world. So you're thinking about the Queen of England. You have an intentional state that we can characterize as thinking about the Queen of England. It's an open question as far as our starting point is concerned, whether that involves somehow your mind reaching out and making some kind of contact with the Queen of England. Maybe it doesn't involve that at all. That's an open question. So um, sometimes when people talk about intentionality, they bring on board a whole bunch of assumptions about intentionality that intentionality does successfully connect us to the world, um, that, um, that intentionality is a relation between us and queens and whatever it is that we're thinking about. But as far as what we can introspectively observe in these everyday examples of the sort that I gave, like you know, um, perceptually experiencing shapes and colors, thinking about whatever, thinking about the Queen of England, your example, um, as far as what we can at the very get-go, uh, uncontroversially say about this phenomenon, we can't, we shouldn't commit ourselves to any kind of view that's so substantive that says that intentionality involves the thing that's thought about after all, and we shouldn't um, after all, because we can think about things that don't exist and all that. So, um, so right. some of the worries that, I, that maybe are coming up in the chat are, you know, some people are like, well, I think there's intentionality at all. Uh, I think they might be employing a more substantive characterization of intentionality. 
Okay, so it doesn't. So we're just starting, and uh, this is something Angela's uh, influential in as well, thinking about how exactly we ultimately define intentionality and whether we think of it as something that's relational, that relates us to the world, or or, or is non-relational. Um, but so at the moment, so as not to get things too complicated to start off, we're just starting off with this this intuitive idea that our mental state seemed seem to us when we introspect to be about something. My thought about the queen seems to be about the queen. My thought of my visual experience, of the table seems to be about the table. Right. And then it's, we can at least start there. Mm -hmm. Even if we end up somewhere different. Yeah. The idea yeah. is that we should have as neutral as possible, a starting point. So we notice that we have thoughts and experiences and they seem to say something. So you might say, what's up with that? What's that? What, what's our metaphysical story of that phenomenon? Mm -hmm. Does also, it involve a relation to things or not? Um, does it involve causal relations? Does it involve um, internal functional roles of brain states? Does it involve consciousness? Mm -hmm. I, I wonder if I could just come at this perhaps from a slightly different angle. I, so there's, there's, there seem to be two things here, thought and, and experience which on the face of it look rather different. And your view is that really that thought is actually a form of experience or based on experience or requires experience. You can't have thought about things without experience. So experience is the central thing. That's, I think that's uh, uh, the most simplified way of putting it. But it, I mean, thinking about it perhaps from the point of view of, say, let's think about people working in AI to build uh, artificial intelligences and robots that can interact with the world. Um, then I think the nature of artificial experience, artificial consciousness is often regarded as quite a, bit, quite a big puzzle. But I think maybe that artificial thought and representation seems a bit, bit more, more tractable. And there are all sorts of, I mean, after all, uh, AI is all about building machines that can gather information about the world, that can detect features of the world and process that information, use that information to categorize things around them and engage in what might call reasoning with that information to produce decisions as to how to respond and perhaps reports. And they could report to us and say there, there is a, you know, there's a, there's a, uh, an apple there on the table in front of me uh, and this sort of thing and we could imagine perhaps those sorts of projects i mean they're already fairly sophisticated in what artificial intelligence but we can imagine those being developed to the point where you have a robotic creature that can interact with its environment recognize features of its might but take attitudes towards its environment can say whether it likes this or doesn't like this maybe it can sit down and discuss things with us and say whether it it likes the way we've decorated the room or have, can have opinions about politics, say, uh, about the, the, the Trump and Johnson and about the pandemic and these sorts of things, all on the basis of these basically representational processes, information processing mechanisms that we've designed it to have. Yet none of that seems to involve consciousness as such. I mean, the, the designer the, so it might, it might design one of these machines and say, look, it can do all this stuff and it can talk and... Yeah, but it, I don't think it's conscious. I don't think it has any sort of experience. Now, uh, what's going on there? Is that is that does it not really? Is it not really thinking? Does it not really have intentionality? Uh, yes, this, it depends. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. No, no. Uh, yeah. I mean, what's it? What's it missing? Uh, I, I suppose is what I'm asking. In terms of the intentionality aspect, that it needs experience for. Um, okay, so. It, so definitely, I want to say that there's such thing as tracking, um, having being causally sensitive to external stimuli, um, having internal functional roles, internal processing, um, all that. And none of that, um, I mean, without further assumptions, none of that requires consciousness. And maybe if you're a panpsychist, that requires consciousness. But just, uh, you know, you don't just from the just from from setting aside the panpsychism as far as is concerned, uh, none of that requires consciousness. You can have all that, okay? Um, and we have all that too. 
right? So we also track things in the environment. We also have internal processing. You know, we're not just pure consciousnesses. Okay. But if you don't have the consciousness, I would say, I mean, I haven't given arguments yet for the view, but the view is that the, this, uh, this robot doesn't have intentionality. Um, does it have thought? I mean, it depends what you mean by thought. If you, you know, have a watered down version of thought mm -hmm. such that what it's doing counts as thought, fine. But it doesn't, if, if thought requires intentionality, no, it doesn't have that. It's just going through the motions. So what it's lacking is, uh, you could put it like an awareness of a content, which is something we have. When we think something, we're entertaining a content. Like metaphorically, before our mind's eye, we are, you know, we, we have this content before us. We can... Um, we can introspect on it. We can, um, we can, depending on your views of mental causation, maybe you know that content can can do something for us. We can reason with it. Um, so, open question: exactly what that looks like, what that amounts to, and you know what kinds of psychological roles these contents can play. But that machine is lacking that. At best, it's just going through the motions. And that's this 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 what it's lacking here isn't just a matter of. Uh, increasing the complexity of those kind of processes. It's, it's something of a different kind that it needs to have to, to enter the world of genuine intentionality. It's, mm -hmm. there's, there's some, it's a metaphysical, might say, um, difference. It's not, no amount of further engineering is going to, to, to solve this on its own. There's something right. further has got to happen, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, mean, I, th I think that that's certainly helped yeah. clarify the position. I think. Could know. we just clarify the word content because it is a sort of semi-technical uh, yeah. term, isn't it? People might not be so familiar with Angela. Would you? Could, yeah, you... absolutely. Um, yeah. And just on that content, um, Searle was uh, is one of the um, one of the first people, one of the you know, first people who argued for a kind of phenomenal intentionality theory. So yeah, this is very much like Searle. Mm -hmm. um, so what's content? Uh, content is what is represented. So what your mental state says. So if you're if you're having an intentional state of a red triangle or whatever, then the content is red triangle or there is a red triangle or there is a red triangle in front of me or something like that. So that's what's meant by content. So these things are closely connected on the so intentionality is we're defining is this intuitive sense that our mental states are about something and then the content is sort of what they're about. So when you're talking about entertaining a content, you're sort of reflecting on what your mental state is about. I can reflect on my thought about the queen. In that sense, I'm reflecting on the on the content of my thought. What it's about. Content for it to be a content, right? Mm. So the content is right. just, it's so, so when we talk about intentional states, we can talk about what their content is. So their content is what they say. So mm -hmm. if I'm thinking that grass is green, the content is that grass is green. Mm -hmm. So it's just a way of picking out um, a feature. It could be the only feature um, of intentional states, which is the what they're about. But the, the aboutness here, the content here for you, Angela, is not, it's, it's, it's different from what, well, it's not, can't be identified with what the thing refers to in the world. It's not, if, if I'm, thinking about a, a, an apple in front of me, that you might say the content is that apple, but that's not, I think, your, your view. It's not the, the thing itself that is the content. It's something in my mind that maybe, you know, latch, uh, you know latches onto that thing, but the content itself is not, the, th the thing itself is not part of the content. So that's not- Yeah, the thing. Yes. that's that a good clarification. Um, so as far as the starting point is concerned, our definition of intentionality, the definition is neutral on whether content is the same thing as the thing in the world that in a successful case you refer to, right? So when I think about uh, the Queen of England, one view might be that the Queen of England herself is part of the content. Yeah. Another view might be that, you know, the content is some description of the Queen, but not the Queen herself. Another view might be that the content is some kind of idea or like phenomenal state. Um, so there are, these are all different views of what the content ends up being. But as far as our initial starting point and definition of intentionality is concerned, um, we're remaining neutral on what the content ends up being. Um, right. And as you mentioned, Keith, ultimately, I want to say that the content is not the referent. Right. So when you think about the Queen of England, the content does not include as a part uh, the Queen herself. So, With some caveats, there's more complex, but that's basically, yeah, at so, least the phenomenal content, the content that's constituted by the experience itself doesn't include external objects that 
would be the reference um, of your so your uh, yeah uh, uh, so, and, uh, and some people would say that the the, the content um I'm not sure how many would say it nowadays but certainly the person has said this that the content is a sort of description of whatever it is that you're thinking about like so you're thinking about the person who uh, is the uh, reigning monarch of uh United Kingdom, and that happens to pick out this particular individual, Elizabeth Windsor. Um, but the content itself is something like a description. Now, in your view, it's it's not that. It's it's something more more like an experience. Uh, so, so, so it's it's a sort of now, help me here. What um, it's I think of experience in in this phenomenal sense of sort of feeling. So is it a kind of aboutness feeling? It's a Help me to to understand how, what the content is in your view. It's a so I don't think the two ideas are are incompatible. So something mm. could be a description that's constituted by uh, by phenomenal experiences. Right. Um, so uh, so that's not that's so it's not like either or. Um, right. I do, I'm I'm sympathetic towards descriptivism that a lot of our contents are descriptive. Um, I don't think a lot of our phenomenal contents are descriptive. So I don't think we go around thinking in descriptions, okay. right? I don't think that's part of our conscious experience. But I think there's a role to be played. Maybe we'll, you know, get into that later in, um, in um, uh, by descriptivism as well. Okay, okay, yeah. So uh, maybe to answer your question, um, what your at least your your phenomenal content or your experiential content the contents that are constituted by your consciousness as far as those are concerned and these are the most fundamental kinds of contents mm -hmm. as far as those are concerned they are basically constituted by your phenomenology by what it's like to be you which may or may not have a descriptive form it doesn't have to but it could so um, yeah. i have a sort of so I, I i kind of introspect and i i'm aware of this feeling and the feeling itself is a feeling of of aboutness. Is that is that right? Ab yeah, aboutness to... relating to a specific kind of thing. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, mm. I don't want to say that there is. So the claim is not that there is a feeling of aboutness. Mm -hmm. I maybe there is. Maybe there's a phenomenology of aboutness. You know, over and above the phenomenology that determines the particular contents that you represent. Uh, but that's not the claim. The claim is that the state of aboutness um, is constituted by the phenomenology not that you know when i have when i'm thinking about something i've got a feeling that you know that accompanies that like oh there i go thinking about something i've got that that thinking about something itch again or something like that that's not the claim so so what is the what is the um the the experience itself then in which the aboutness is grounded what is the how i mean is it just a it's not just an it's not a sort of image of the queen or something that in in my what exactly what exactly is the experience that, that's the root of all this so i think the case of thought is um is more complicated than the case of perceptual representation so in the case of perceptual representation i think a lot of the contents are just what you're experiencing they're they're phenomenally grounded directly um, the case of thought i want to say that a lot of our contents are derived contents. So they're not this most more basic or fundamental or original kind of intentionality, but rather a kind of intentionality that's derived from them. So what I would say about the case of the queen is that you've got some in some kind of impoverished phenomenal content that's constituted by the phenomenology. You got some experience, um, whatever it is, it could just be a verbalization in your head of the mm -hmm. word. It could be an image of the queen. It could be different things on different occasions. Probably it is. It could be a gisty grasp of, you know, of, of queen, of a monarch or something like that, but not a full understanding of that. Um, however, I think that you are disposed to take this, um, this, you know, whatever, this impoverished phenomenal content to stand for a more complex, perhaps descriptive content. And now we're talking about derived representation. So we've got this extra content that's kind of hanging out in the background. It's not experienced. You have it in virtue of these dispositions to um, to take or accept that what you're actually currently thinking, and that's phenomenally constituted, stands for something else. <laughs> that could be a description. That could even be the queen herself. So yeah. you, know, you might even um, you might even take yourself to 
uh, you might ascribe to your phenomenal content the referent of some description as opposed to the descriptive content itself. So there's room for all that, but it all goes in um, in derived representation. I don't think you're actually currently thinking, phenomenally thinking the description or the queen herself. But, so, but, but yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I, that, that sounds, that sounds, that sounds plausible. So, but, but the basis of it all, well, right now, I mean, I guess I am thinking about the queen right now because we're having this conversation. The, 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 what it's all grounded in is something queen related in my experience, either a vague sort of image of, of an old woman in a, with, wearing a crown or the, the sound of the word queen, you know, hearing it either said or uh, in my mind's in inner speech or some some something sense is it is this right that it's something there's some sort something sensory related to the queen in my experience and that's the root of the of, of my thought about the queen is that, is that right um i mean so there there are two things there's the uh the original content of yeah. your thought so this is the more basic the most oh, that's, that's the one I'm, mental yeah. kind of content and then there's the derived content which yeah. comes from it the original content, um, as far as my view is concerned, there are, there are different options here, and they might, you know, different options might be true in different cases, and even in the same kind of case, like thinking about the queen on different occasions or for different mm -hmm. people. Sure. Um, so you've named some of the options. There could be a sensory content. So when I'm thinking about the queen, what I'm phenomenally representing mm -hmm. is like some kind of image of her face, um, you know, or like a crown or something, or like some queen-like imagery or something like that. There could be some verbal content in addition to that, or instead of that, the word queen. Yeah. Um, so I think we do think a lot in words, but not only in words, but words accompany a lot of our thoughts. Um, there could be some, some, uh, some genuine cognitive phenomenology. So there could be something that it's like to think about queens that isn't sensory so it doesn't occur oh, in sensory experience so that is another option as well it, um, you could have only that or you could have that in addition to the sensory and verbal uh, phenomenal contents but it kind of doesn't really matter what it is because mm -hmm. this content mainly serves like it's it's functional role inside you is as being a placeholder for these other contents that are connected to it and that capture your fuller understanding of what the queen is, and so it's a sort of anchor for the for the for the for the for the, for the thought. This this, this the, the phenomenal bit is is that right? Is that Sorry, right? again. It's a sort of anchor. The, the phenomenal bit is a sort of anchor for your thinking about the queen. Is that, would that yeah? Would that I mean, it's sort of like stand in. Um, mm. it, so in a sense, thought is symbolic in that you use one thing to think about something else because yeah. it's really cognitively taxing to be thinking your full understanding of the queen. Every time you wanna think about the queen, you you bring to bear this definite description that refers to the queen and nothing else. Um, but if you need it, you are able to uh, to pull it out of your pocket or to recreate it, right? So it's it's like a little, yeah. So it's, there's some sort of token in your experience. I'll let, I'll let, I'll let Philip come in. There's some sort of token in your experience or something. And that's what sort of, the the focus of your your queen thoughts and then there's various things you can do because you've got that focus there mm -hmm. um but the idea is that the, that the experience is providing this this um yes this sort of tag on which you can yes okay i i, I that, yeah. that, that's helpful i better let philip come in now Keith, you're going wildly off script <laughs> i like that um way of putting I, it you can use this tag to form new beliefs about queens and now you don't have to be thinking all your queen information every time you think about the queen you use the tag right but you can always unpack it and get back to your, your full understanding of a queen. Sorry, Philip. No, no, it's good. No, it's good. So yeah, I mean, I think we're, we're getting really into the, the, the detail. Bit, but I think that was, that was what was helpful for me anyway. I helped me understand yeah. the position. So. We get, I mean, getting into the details of, I mean, I think Angela's got one of the most worked out uh, mm -hmm. elaborate versions of this view, Obviously, but yeah. I think, I think the going back to the non-conscious robot, I think mm -hmm. is a good way to just, mm -hmm. Get people to see people might be thinking what, what is the point of this what's this debate about but thinking about a robot that is you know so sophisticated in the future that it can have a conversation it can interact with the world in in its behavior it's just the, the same as a human being but let's say by stipulation that we know it's not conscious let's say we, we we've learned that things made of metal are not conscious somehow and um, so we know this robot you know you can talk to it and it has memories and everything 
but we know there's nothing that it's like to be it. And then the, the debate is, does this robot have thoughts, right? If it's talking about the pandemic and its, its views, what we should have done, does it really understand these issues? Does it really have opinions? Or is it just kind of parroting the words? So I guess, I guess, I'm, you know, I mean, to set that Keith would say, I think, uh, you know, it, it, it does have opinions. It does understand stuff because of its, it has the right kind of not just behavior, but information processing and so on. Whereas Angela would say, no, it doesn't really understand things. It doesn't really have opinions uh, because these things are grounded in consciousness and it doesn't have consciousness so just to, just to set up the debate vividly angela is that is that the, is that the way you think about it or yeah that's fair as long as you're using all those mental state terms like opinions in a way that requires intentionality intentionality yeah so obviously it, it does get tricky exactly what, what we mean by intentionality okay so just to try and get a bit more into the 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 for and against arguments so if we could just lay out you mentioned briefly i think tracking so so let's just try and characterize the opposing view so your view is that intentionality is grounded in consciousness so the non-conscious robot doesn't have it one one leading opposing view is that that, that would say the non-conscious robot does have intentionality so what do they ground intentionality in one common view is tracking uh for which you don't need consciousness so can you maybe lay lay out that that a bit and then we can get into some of the alleged problems with this tracking view yeah, so this, this tracking view is a really popular naturalistic theory of intentionality because it tries to understand intentionality in terms of natural ingredients like causal relations to things in the world. It doesn't bring in anything um, irreducibly mental or you know supernatural or anything like that. So it's a really attractive view um, and a lot of people, a lot of philosophers especially really like it. So the tracking theory says that basically um, intentionality at bottom, at least the most basic or fundamental or original kind of intentionality is a matter of being causally sensitive to or having the function of being causally sensitive to um, or being causally sensitive to in certain ideal conditions um, or caring information about or more generally, we might say tracking things in the environment. So, for example, say you've got an internal state, call it S. Um, you've got this internal state S, and every time there is a cat present around you, um, you're wired up so that S goes off. So you, you have a token of S. So you think you, 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 you have uh, S occurs. So the state S occurs every time there's a cat. Um, according to a tracking theory, uh, that theory might say that, I mean, there's some nuances, but the theory would say that uh, that this state S represents cats because it's a good indicator or tracker of cats. Um, so basically, we're just sophisticated thermometers, according to the tracking theory. So a thermometer tracks the temperature; it's causally sensitive to, and hence tracks, um, uh, you know, how hot and cold things are, what the temperature is of things um, around it um, that it's applied to. Similarly for us, we're just sophisticated thermometers. We track a whole bunch of different features of our environment, different properties, different conditions um, of our environment, at least in the case of the more basic or fundamental kind of intentionality. Maybe you can build other kinds of intentionality out of that. But at bottom, intentionality is just a matter of keeping track of things in your environment. Brilliant. That was fantastic. So and just we had an earlier conversation on Mind Chat with David Papano who I guess, which was uh, how does consciousness connect us to reality, part one, who I guess has that, kind of, basically, broadly speaking, that view of what intentionality is. And so so I hope it's clear to listeners and viewers why the non-conscious robot would have intentionality on that view. It doesn't have consciousness, but you don't need it. You just need to track things in the right way. And it's causally set up to track things in the right way so it doesn't have consciousness. Okay, so what's wrong with that then? Uh, well, a no, bunch that sounded things. a bit aggressive, didn't it? Sorry, go on. What, what's wrong with that? Wrong with that. Um, so one problem is uh, is something that um, I like to call the mismatch problem, which is basically that tracking theories uh, make the wrong predictions in certain cases about what we represent. So take, for example, a perceptual experience that represents redness. So maybe you're, you know, representing that um, there's a red triangle in front of you or something like that. So take the redness bit of that content. Um, so according to the tracking theory, so what do we track um, and hence represent something like 
dispositions to reflect light of various wavelengths, or maybe the, you know, the, the physical categorical bases of these dispositions, something sophisticated and complex um, like that having to do with reflecting wavelengths of light. But um, unfortunately, that's not what we represent. Um, we don't represent, we can't even tell from our own experiences from seeing something red, what dispositions to reflect light it has. So this isn't a content that's in any way available to us. It's too complex, too sophisticated. It includes features that were in no sense entertaining when we represent something as red. Um, and uh, and it leaves out features that we are entered. It leaves out what we are entertaining when we represent something as red. Namely, it leaves out the intrinsic quality of redness um, that we represent red things as having. Okay, so it gets the wrong answer base. The tracking theory makes the wrong predictions about what we represent in certain cases. Um, so that's a kind of empirical reason to 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 see that it's to to think that it's wrong. It gives us the wrong answers. Brilliant. So that's I like the way you put it. It's predictions. So it's so just the thought is if if the tracking view were right, then like what I'm tracking when I look at this is that the, the sort the wavelength, the physical property of wavelength. Uh, but when I attend to my perceptual experience, it doesn't seem like that's what's represented in my experience. It seems like it's this um, almost non-physical sort of greenish intrinsic property of the forget non-physical maybe that's pushing it a bit far but it's this intrinsic property of the surface i'm not need to hold it up to the camera don't I? that's uh you know this what david chalmers calls edenic green or edenic blue like these colors as we naively take them to be they're like intrinsic properties of surfaces and that seems like a very different property to the uh physical wavelength reflections just i mean i'm just preempting just to preempt um misunderstanding of what you're saying here it's not like you're you're not necessarily committed to colors as we naively take them to be really being out there in the world it's not like you have to think um greenness as we naively take it to be really exists out there some people might be saying well that doesn't exist it's just that it's about what our mental states represent our mental states seem to represent colors as intrinsic properties of surfaces of objects and it looks like that the, the tracking view, you know, what the robot is tracking are these wavelength properties. What I'm tracking are these wavelength properties. So there's a mismatch between what the theory is saying and the reality of what our mental states represent. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And um, I just want to follow up on that. Um, so I definitely don't think that there are these primitive colors out there in the world. Um, and it's really hard to say that if you're a tracking theorist, because, you know, because what you're tracking has to be something that's out there in the world, or at least that, you know, something. So I don't want to say that you can't track uninstantiated properties. You can, but it, but, uh, it requires some special gymnastics and these kinds of views. So it's really hard for a tracking theorist to say that you have this special, you're set up to, you know, to, to be causally sensitive to properties that are not instantiated. In fact, when uh, when there are good candidate properties that you're you're that are very good at triggering your um, your mental states. All so, right. So it's, it's, it's easy. I don't want to be a realist about colors, um, and that's another problem with the tracking theory, which is if you don't want to be a realist about colors as we perceive them, um, if you want to say that our perceptual experiences reliably misrepresent the world, so we see things as red, but really they have some other property. We're tracking one property but we're experiencing and representing a different uh, way the world might be. And we're just systematically wrong about that, but because the wrongness is systematic, it all works out well, right? So everything that we perceptually experience is red. It will continue to look red in different circumstances. It look red, looks red to you too. So we can talk about redness and use it to coordinate our behaviors, um, even though nothing is red, right? So, we're, so it's, it's a systematic illusion, uh, but because it's systematic, uh, uh, it's useful. So if you're a tracking theorist, you can't say that about redness. Could I, could I just come in quickly here, Philip? I, um, I've got, I, um, I think the tracking theorist has got a response to, to that, which I, I, I don't want to spend too much time over because it would be diverting us off track, but I think what, off track, uh, I think you can say that what's being tracked here is not just a worldly property, but a worldly property as it, 
as affecting us in a certain way. And so what we're tracking is not just the property, but the property's effects upon us. And when you factor in the effects upon us, then you get a much richer conception of what's being tracked and what's being represented, one that comes more closely in line with uh, our naive notion of the feel of the thing. So if you're tracking your own reactions to this wavelength of light, then I think you can close the gap a bit. But anyway, but that's that's my own hobby horse, and so I won't ride it here. Let me just... Um, let me just put another question to you. That's see, the, the objection you have there is, oh, somebody caught my pun. Um, uh, that seems to, uh, that problem for tracking theory seems to arise for what I call secondary qualities. But what about other, what about primary, what about things like size and, sh and shape and distance and uh, these kind of motion, these seem, uh, these don't, the problem doesn't seem to, if I am tracking the, that there's a square object at a certain distance from me, uh, uh, perhaps moving in a certain direction, there doesn't seem to be any, uh, 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 the, the, that, that's what the experience is of, of, some, of a square object. I don't, there, is, there isn't that extra uh, dimension that seems to be missed out by tracking there. So is this a problem just for, is it just a problem for certain quality, certain features or would you say even there, there's a there's something missed out by tracking? Um, so let me just say something first about the objection that the, the tracking theorists might make to this kind of argument. So the tracking theorists, you're suggesting maybe the tracking theorists will say we're representing dispositional properties of objects to affect us in certain ways. So I can capture the redness of red because it's in my consciousness. And what I'm representing is that something is disposed to cause me to have this, um, this redness experience. Um, and I think that is a way to capture the redness of red, of red and get that in the content. Unfortunately, the tracking theorist also captures all this other garbage too. So the dispositional component. So they make color experiences be dispositional, sorry, the content of color experiences be dispositional and relational, which is much more sophisticated um, than they in fact are. So, uh, so for example, um, they, they involve every color experience I have involves me or my mental states as a relatum. So I'm perceiving things as affecting my mental states all the time when I'm you know, perceiving a colorful world. And that just doesn't, I don't think that um, that is a plausible content attribution. I don't yeah. think we're always perceiving ourselves or our mental states when we see things as color. There's a lot of, there's a, lot of there's, there's a whole debate we could go into here and I, I think it would take us again off track to do it, but I, I, think don't, that's think it I don't think it has to be a if you want to pursue it for a bit, Keith, I think okay. I don't think it has to be a disposition debate. to affect our mental state. Certainly not in the way I would tell you to disposition to cause certain uh, phenomenally conscious experiences. Um, but it could be just uh, a disposition to. Um, oh, in fact, it doesn't even have to be a disposition. It could be calling something red. Just to say that I'm having a red experience is to say that some feature of the world is impacting me, uh, where this impact isn't necessarily just related to conscious to, to what's what's uh, what's in, present in my consciousness. It's impacting me in a certain way that's characteristic of red things, uh, and that's uh, the, the 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 primary use is is uh, for a. Uh, a current events, you know, that, that's red because it's doing the red thing to me. And then when we, we talk about things generally being red there because they are disposed to do the red thing to us when, we, when we're in touch with them. So I think there are ways of, of the, the tracking and that what, what we're tracking is uh, that tendency in things. Um, and I feel that's even worse though because now you're not <laughs> even getting the redness of red. It's just a mere dispositional, you know, property to affect me in certain ways, and so there's there isn't the primitive redness anywhere embedded in that, um, which is what we want to capture. Well, right? the, the primitive there, redness is the, is the actual impact. It. So it's too much and too little. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, as I, I as I said, this is going to. Um, I think I don't want to. Oh, I, I like this debate. Okay, okay. Well, I, I think the, the primitive we redness, the primitive redness as, uh, when we talk about the primitive redness, we're, we're talking, I think, about the, the actual impact that red things make on us. That's, that's what we mean by the primitive redness. It's there, we're in this dynamical relation with a bit of the world that is impacting us in a certain way that has a certain significance for us across all sorts of dimensions, affective, cognitive, uh, all kinds of things have all sorts of priming effects, and we're labeling that. That's the that's this state that I'm in now. That's what I call primitive redness. And then when we describe things that are not currently doing that to us as being red, we simply mean they're of the kind that would tr 
trigger that that kind of thing if we were in the right sort of contact with them. Um, which, um, we, we, what's wrong with that? And we're tracking features that would do that primitive redness thing to us. So what we're trying to capture is this um, introspectively observable phenomenon of have of our having mental states that seem to say something or present the world as being a certain way. Mm -hmm. um, and what you're describing is introspectively implausible as a characterization of how the world seems to me when I see things as colored. I'm not experiencing things as being disposed to impact me in this way that is characteristic of things that are classified as in the same way as this one, don't mention red, right? <laughs> um, rather, I'm seeing things as being primitively red. Maybe you don't like the primitive, but at least as having this redness quality, um, right? And, mm -hmm. and I feel like that doesn't come in anywhere in the picture and all this other stuff that doesn't characterize how I represent things does come in. Um, so I mentioned that I think this is introspectively inaccurate um, as a characterization of what we're representing when we perceive something as red. Um, I also think that this content attribution, um, the, the, it doesn't reflect the psychological roles um, or it's not reflected in the psychological roles of our redness perceptual, um, perceptual states. So our perceptual states of redness dispose us to make certain inferences about objects, um, to behave in certain ways. Um, they, they play whatever, I mean, there are different views of what the psychological roles are, but I don't think there's any indication when you look at the psychological roles of these uh, mental states that they represent this complex content of the sort that involves my own reactions and whatever. And that doesn't involve the primitive redness. Well, but, but it, hmm. I, I, it isn't when I think about something as being read, I think of it as something that, if I were to be in, in the right sort of perceptual encounter with it, would have a certain effect on me. Um, say, if I think of something as being sweet, I think of it as something that, if I were in the right sort of perceptual contact with it, would have a certain impact on me, an impact that I that I like that motivates me in certain ways or whatever. Um, uh, so I think of them as things. I think of the world as populated with. Uh, let's yes, use the term affordances, you know, um, uh, things that afford me one kind of um, response or another kind of response. Uh, and I think of my what, my, what my brain is doing is tracking the various affordances of things around me. And in a sense, that's dispositional because they're not, you know, when I think about something as being sweet, when I think about it as being sweet, and I'm not actually tasting it, I'm not actually having that sweetness encounter right now, but I'm just thinking about it as something that would afford all the reactions that, you know, sweet things afford if I were to engage with it. So I don't see that the idea that, that, um, that these things are, uh, I know I don't have to, they don't, you know, I can think about pain when I'm not in pain, right? So I'm, what I'm thinking about is about a state that would, uh, that if I were in it would have all sorts of characteristic effects on me. Um, so I don't see what I'm missing really from that way of, I mean, that, that is. So I don't disagree with a lot of what you said. Um, so I do think that in some cases not, I don't think in the case of color, but in some cases we do perceive affordances. Mm -hmm. right? So I do, th and I think that that shows up in the phenomenology. Um, and I do think that we can, think about uh, about colors and that when we think about colors, the derived content might be a lot like what you're describing. Mm. Especially for us kind of less naive um, um, thinkers of color, maybe the naive, you know, maybe we all start off thinking when we think about colors, thinking that things have primitive, you know, redness or blueness mm -hmm. qualities, but then we reconstruct our concept. We're like, well, okay, there's nothing like that out there. We reconstruct our concepts so that um, and I think the derived content picture gives you a picture of how that could be possible. You just change the way that you unpack your concept to reflect your, on, your, your ongoing learning about what the world is like um, and what you're actually tracking with your concept. So you can reconstruct your color concepts to be something very much like what, what you're saying, Keith. But this all occurs at the level of thought. Um, with a caveat, I mean, I also think that perceptual experiences can have derived contents. So maybe your perceptual experience of redness derivatively represents something like what what you're saying, like a dispositional you know thing, because you know that there is no primitive thing. So you kind of reconstruct your concept, 
and uh, and you know form the right dispositions to unpack your perceptual experience to this um, this you know this other content. That is fine. But what I really want to hold on to is that at least the original phenomenal content, sorry, the original content um, of your um, of your perceptual experience when you represent something as red is this kind of Edenic redness, to use Chalmers' term, um, this kind of perfect primitive redness, this, uh, this redness exactly as it appears to be, and not something dispositional, relational, involving me, involving my brain states, involving other things that are similar or something like that. I think mm. that's over intellectualizing the content that we ascribe um, to our perceptual experiences. I'm inclined to agree with you that we do conceptualize them in that way. I just think it's a, I think it's just, I'd say it's a misconceptualization. Um, but I'm inclined to agree with you that that we can, or at least we, I'm not sure that conceptualization is quite so sort of naive and untheoretically informed as, 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 as we think it is. Um, but yeah, we're getting, we're getting into sort of deeper issues about, about, about I don't want to get, Side what about the issue about whether this is is it for for is this just a problem about secondary qualities for tracking theories? What about can't tracking theories handle a lot of the other um, uh, features we um, we think about? Yeah. So in some cases, I think there's a less compelling reason to think that there is a mismatch between what you track and what you represent. Um, like you mentioned, I think shape and mm. whatever size, distance. I don't know. Most um, yeah. I'm actually attracted to the view that you're really reliably misrepresenting through and through and all of all of perception. But I think there's a less clear case for um, for for these being cases of uh, of reliable misrepresentation. Did, did so you just say we're we're misrepresenting in every case? Just, uh, just... Yeah, all of your experience is a big illusion. But, <laughs> but I don't. Wow. Think, well, I don't think that's I don't think that's obvious though. You have to you know have to compare what are you actually what is your perceptual experience committed to when it says you know this is like this far away from me and then what is space really like and is what space is really like does that satisfy the content that you're committed to and i think probably not but i don't think that's as obvious at the get-go as the case of color i think the case of color is much more obvious so for for the purposes here let's just say the tracking theory gets a lot of cases right or it's not obviously wrong that's fine, um, but it still gets cases wrong, and those are non-negotiable. So uh, I, I think the cases that it gets right, it kind of gets right by accident. <laughs> okay, brilliant. Okay, so that's the first objection. So we've got the your view, Angela, the phenomenal intentionality theory. We've got the opposing view, the tracking theory. So it's what grounds consciousness? Your view, sorry, what grounds intentionality? The the aboutness of mental mental states. Your view is consciousness. The other view is tracking. The tracking view that. It's facts about what we track that grounds intentionality. First objection, this mismatch problem that they, I, I like the way you're putting it as an empirical object, they just get things wrong. They would say, the tracking view would say, we're, we're, we're tracking wavelengths, but we're, but we're not. Okay, so give me, have you got another objection? I do. <laughs> you. Um, That's handy. Uh, more like a, a priori metaphysical objection, um, which is that tracking... My favorite kind. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like, um, tracking relations can't do the kind of work that they need to do um, in order to get you intentionality. They're just not the right kind of thing. So the worry is that tracking just by itself is not enough, like just being causally sensitive, like being such that you're causally sensitive to cats or whatever surface reflectance properties or whatever it is that you're you know, causally sensitive to isn't enough to make you entertain that content. So I can be causally sensitive to cats, but that doesn't mean that I'm thinking about cats, I'm not entertaining cat. Um, our represented contents, our intentional contents play a psychological role in the mental economy. And the role that they play is appropriate to the content that they are. Uh, so they play a role in reasoning and in behavior. They pr play a role in our phenomenology of grasping contents, um, in being available to form the targets of higher order thoughts so I can think about what I'm thinking about. Um, something on the far end of a tracking relation, something that I'm merely disposed to be sensitive to or something like that, can't insert itself in our minds to play all those roles just in virtue of being on that far end of a tracking relation. So the, the view is kind of magical 
and anti-naturalistic if you really think about it. And this is actually kind of a point that, that Hillary Putnam made. Um, he, he argued that tracking theories are supposed to be naturalistic, but, um, but they're really magical at the end of the day. You know, if you look at what they need to do, what the tracking theory, what the tracking relations need to do, like insert contents in our mind. So they can't do that. Um, so that's a second problem, um, which is that tracking is not, you could put it, is not metaphysically sufficient for representing a content. Tracking is just tracking. I, I think probably most, uh, well, certainly want tracking theories also um, teleological theorists would say, no, of course it's not. It's got to be, it's got, you've got to tell a story about the consumption side of the representations, about what these representations are used for. And that merely an informational relation to the world, sure, you know, the informational relations are kind of cheap. Um, they, it's, they, 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 you need, you need two components. You need the, the informational side and then the, 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 um, the representation that's produced then needs to be consumed by a system that treats it as uh, carrying information about whatever it, you know, it's connected with or usually connected with. And that's where you, you, the, the magic is, as it were, discharged. Um, so, well, yeah, so I think it still might not be right, but I think they, they, they do have an answer to that. Well, um, it depends on how you're going to understand the treatment. So mm -hmm. if it's, you know, if it's, if it's, um, if it's merely functional, then um, then this starts looking um, like a kind of combination of a tracking view with a functional role view. Um, and then I think there are different problems with that, like that functional role underdetermines content. There are different kinds of contents that could play the same kinds of functional role, and that's not enough to pin down the actual content. So you'll see that a lot of functional role views then invoke tracking relations to um, to uh, to pin down the content and they inherit all the problems of tracking theories. But maybe what you have in mind is something more like Ruth Millikan's view, exactly. uh, right? Where uh, what sets the content is the function of the consumer and the function of the consumer of the represent. So the consuming system, the system that uses the representation, its function is set by natural selection and what it was you know, useful um, uh, when it was useful for you to uh, to token that representation mm -hmm. um, to enable certain kinds of behaviors. Mm -hmm. uh, then again, I think you're going to end up with a mismatch problem because when it was useful to token the representation can come apart from what the representation actually represents precisely in cases of reliable misrepresentation. So it's useful for you to experience uh, to, to represent uh, fruit as sweet or whatever. Um, but maybe there's no primitive property of sweetness. Maybe that's what you're representing, but there's no such property. There's nutritiousness, there's having sugar, there's whatever, um, but that's not what you represent. So again, you're gonna end up um, having mismatch cases with this kind of view as well. So do you think the mismatch problem is the fundamental one then in that, in that case? No, I think there's also a metaphysical sufficiency problem because you know why should some fact about your evolutionary past um, you know, of whatever well, sort. It can also be develop, but develop, it's not just about evolution. It's, it's some sort of selection process, but it can be developmental. You know, it can sure. be highly you're, you're not an evolutionary past, you're a developmental past. Why mm -hmm. should these facts um, and the contents assigned to you on the basis of these facts be entertained by you and play certain psychological uh, roles you, in you? You see, actually, there's, there's, there's I'm, I'm quite sympathetic, you know, to what you said because I think what these these these, these stories we're talking about, these track, these informational stories, teleological stories, the stories about subpersonal representation, and I think they 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 do an awful lot of work in explaining behaviour. But I agree with you that they don't really touch on what we might call, uh, uh, well, what conscious thought. And I um, I think we, we probably do need a separate story for that. Um, and I do like the idea of of there being. Um, images symbols that, uh, that that we treat as symbols that stand in for as placeholders for larger things of course i'm going to tell a different story about the nature of these images from you but the i the, and there's actually as i've been listening to particularly in our earlier exchange oops in our earlier exchange getting excited now you see i'm knocking the microphone in our earlier exchange i, I agreed with a lot of what you said about the way that very no sketchy, no you're not allowed to do that thing of sketchy, you all, we all agree sketchy, sketchy um experiential contents 
mm -hmm. um, can serve as placeholders for um, in, in the way that we might in the way that symbols on a piece of paper can serve as placeholders for uh, doing a calculation or working out where to put things in a room and so on. Mm -hmm. we, we, they 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 are again they afford all kinds of cognitive um, manipulations to <laughs> us um, that. Uh, uh, um, at a personal level, at, at a conscious, I, I'm more inclined to put it in personal and subpersonal terms than contra. Um, and I, I and so I, um, I like this story about the idea that we have these these immediately presented symbols, and then there's all sorts of derivative stuff that they have. They afford all kinds of further operations to us. Of course, I'm going to tell a different story about what I think the nature of those Im images is, and I'm not going to buy the idea that they are, you know, sort of quali or whatever, but. The general structure of there being two sorts, two levels of of, of intentionality, if you like, two two kind, two different ways of latching onto the world, the sort of automatic way that our brains do, and the personal way that we do in virtue of of, of our experiences and our and, the, and 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 the mental imagery we entertain. I'm really really sympathetic to that. So mm -hmm. um, so this is my bit where I get to say that I actually uh, I, I agree with you more than uh, than Philip expected me to. Yeah, and I totally agree that that part of the view is, you know, is independent of, um, you, know, you, could, you could hold that part of the view and still be a track theorist or, you know, have some other kind of theory of intentionality for original intentionality. It's really a picture of derived intentionality. How do you get more intentionality from some intentionality? And then you can combine it with different views of how you get the some intentionality in the first place. And it looks like that's mm. what I want to do. Yeah, no, I... I I'm, I'm, go I'm actually... Um, yeah, I've been wanting for ages, I guess, to disagree with Keith, but now I'm now I'm on the agreeing camp. I'm feeling a bit left out actually. So let me let me try and disagree with this particular argument, uh, the metaphysical sufficiency argument. It's a, it sounds a little bit like the, uh, the the hard problem, you know, people saying, well, f physical states don't seem sufficient for consciousness. You're kind of saying, why is you know, this tracking business or whatever, why is that sufficient for intentionality for having a mental state that's really about something? Mm -hmm. um, but well, maybe I could try out the, the most popular physicalist response to the hard problem, try and see if we can apply that to your metaphysical sufficiency argument here. So they could say, I'm playing Mr. Physicalist, they could say, well, you're assuming the connection between tracking and intentionality has to be a priori. Well, why think that? You know, it could be an empirical identity, like between water and H2O. You know, it's you can't just reflect on the concepts to see that water is H2O, but they turn out to just be the same thing. So why can't the tracking theorist say to you, yeah, there's no conceptual connection between tracking and aboutness, but identifying the two is, you know, part of our best scientific theory. Um, and so we get a kind of empirical identity between intentionality and tracking. Yeah, I mean, I don't think the connection would have to be a priori, like just by thinking about it. Um, but uh, it does have to be plausible, at least, right? So it does have to be the kind of thing that can, you know, you can identify any two things that you want to, right? I mean, that doesn't make it true. So you can, you know, identify intentionality with, I don't know, with like having hair on your head or something like that. Um, doesn't, you know, so, um, and then you can't hide behind the, you know, I'm an a posteriori, um, hair on my head identity theorist. Okay, so it has to be a plausible identity. The thing that you're talking about has to have in it, it has to be plausible, it has in it the capacity to do the job that intentionality is supposed to do. And I just don't see how that can be the case. I mean, it requires a kind of weird action at a distance. So the, you know, the tracking, did we, did we lose Keith? Oh, we've lost Keith. Maybe he'll come back. Should I? Come on, like you, the, carry, carry on, carry on. We're, okay, we're, we're like still, we're still track, alive. The tracking relation is well. It's like it's this relation between you know between your internal states and things in the world, um, you know, like properties in the world or something like that. So it's this this relation um, that uh, you know maybe the properties are abstract things. Maybe it's a relation to abstract things, or maybe you know they're grounded in their instances. But whatever, it's you know it goes beyond the mind. And then, in virtue of having this relation, you have something, you know, in your mind that's kicking around and playing a psychological role and making you behave differently, and you know, um, changing your representational experience, your experience of grasping a certain content, um, and all that. 
And that looks like, that looks very, very implausible and magical. So even if you're happy with, you know, a posteriori identities, they still have to be plausible. Sounds good to me. Sorry to Angela and to viewers. I keep looking down for, for the first time on Mind Chat today. We seem to have lots of people popping up in the chat offering sexual services. I'm sort of playing whack-a-mole blocking all these people. I don't know. But anyway, um, okay, so we've had two objections to your rival view. We're going to get to objections to your view in good time so the viewers and listeners can assess which you know which view they think has the worst problems but i think we're going to go for do, do you have do you happen to have angela not that we've prepared this or anything but do you happen to have one more objection to the tracking view yes i do but it's not my favorite one um but yeah. maybe it's your favorite one <laughs> um yeah. so so a lot of people argue against tracking on the basis of content determinacy so the idea is that uh, that tracking theories cannot ascribe determinate contents. There's an indeterminacy in which contents we represent based on the theory. So the theories um, don't uh, succeed at honing in on the right content. There's an indeterminacy there. So for example, um, somebody mentioned John Searle in the chat. Um, Searle has an argument that goes something like, um, you, can, you can represent water, and you can represent H2O. And um, let's assume that water is necessarily H2O. So not only is the concept of water and H2O, are they coextensive in our world? They're, they, they're the same things are water that are H2O. So it's all the, all the same, but any possible sample of water would be a possible sample of H2O too. So they don't come apart at all. They're necessarily coextensive um, concepts. Okay. Um, still, you can represent one without representing the other. Okay, but tracking is too coarse-grained to accommodate that because you can't track one without tracking the other. So whenever you're tracking um, um, any, any, say, like a causal um, sensitivity to water is also a causal sensitivity to H2O. I mean, they're really the same thing, right? So, so the idea is that representation is more fine-grained than tracking which is too coarse grained to capture all the, the subtleties, subtle differences that we can have in our contents. Um, and Horgan and Tienson and, and Graham also have a different kind of example uh, where you, um, you can represent rabbits or you can represent undetached rabbit parts, but those are also um, coextensive and they're necessarily coextensive. Maybe it's a priori that they're coextensive, um, again, you you can't track one without tracking the other, but you can represent one without representing the other. So um, it looks like the tracking theory can't uh, distinguish between these two contents and, and it uh, predicts that we indeterminately represent, uh, we, we are, what we represent is indeterminate between the two contents. Cool. All right. So this, I guess this is a more technical objection. And um, I guess I put you up to this because, I mean, I, maybe I could just share... My, I mean, my favorite version of this is due to Saul Kripke's discussion of plus and quas in his in his book on um, on um, Wittgenstein on rule following that nobody thinks is a good interpretation of Wittgenstein, but many people think is a is a great work of philosophy in its own right. So people talk about Kripkenstein, um, and he wasn't defending um, phenomenal intentionality theory, by the way. But phenomenal intentionality theorists, some of them perhaps not Angela as, as such, have uh, employed this. And well, the example I like to give, I've, I've got a, a blog post on this if people are interested called um, Can Calculators Add? But they, well, my twist on uh, on Kripke's, Kripke's um, idea. So imagine, so you imagine we've got a really rubbish calculator that can't deal with numbers above 100. So... Um, we still we still tend to think of it as adding up, right? Even though it ca it can't do anything with numbers above a hundred. But now let's define an al an alternative mathematical function quas that is just like plus uh, for numbers under a hundred. But whenever one of the numbers being inputted into the function is a greater than a hundred, the output is always five, right? The answer is just always that's just how we define the function. And now it looks like. Um, there's no fact of the matter as to whether that calculator is performing the plus function or the cross function because 
it would have to be able to deal with numbers greater than 100 for it to, there to be a factor that matter as to whether it's performing the plus function or the cost function. And then you just think, oh, well, that's just a rubbish calculator. But it looks like for any calculator, there's going to be some numbers so huge that the calculator can't deal with them. So we just define the plus, the cost function in, in, in terms of those numbers. And then again, it's, we're going to get the result that there's no factor of the matter as to whether any calculator is performing the plus function or the cost function. And then, okay, you just think, well, this is just about calculators. Who cares? But the worry is, isn't this going to apply to our brains as well? So, so you know, there's there's going to be some numbers so huge our brains can't deal with them. So you define the cost function in terms of some number so huge no human brain could ever deal with it. Um, and then it, and then you get the result that it's just indeterminate when we do when we're thinking about mathematics. It's indeterminate whether our whether we're thinking about the plus whether our thoughts involve plusing plus function or the cost function and it seems something seems to go wrong there because it's it seems like we are when we think maths we are determinately doing addition we are determinately thinking about the plus function but it but it doesn't seem that anything about the finite information processing in our brain could pin that down so i mean i guess to sum up the objection the thought is nothing to do with tracking or information processing or behavioral functioning could pin down the specificity that is, that seems to exist in our thought, but um, it's 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 the most technical of the objections, isn't it? Why don't you like this objection, Angela? Um, yeah, let me just let me just um, say something about plus quest too. Um, so the way that you put it, I think that is a helpful way to put it as a challenge to a different kind, a slightly different, I mean, the related kind of naturalistic theory that says that it's the internal functional role. Um, or maybe the internal functional role together with dispositions to behavior that matters for content. And the plus plus case uh, basically shows, I think, successfully enough um, that internal functional role underdetermines content. Um, so compatible with with you know some internal functional role of your calculator of the states of your calculator, it could be plus or quest that you're representing. Um, so you need something more than that to constrain content attributions. So you can't explain content. Should we just de define functional role? Just, okay, just yeah, yeah, like what an internal state does, right? So an internal state of a of a calculator um, does something. It plays a role. Um, so a, a different kind of view of intentionality that I think we briefly mentioned is a functional role view that says you know it's not what you're tracking, um, but it's the internal role of your mental states that determines their content. So it's what your, uh, what your mental states do that determine their content. Um, so what they do kind of uh, fixes the content that fits given their functional role. And there are different versions of this view. Most of them end up also invoking tracking relations to help pin down how we're gonna interpret mental states given their functional role. Um, the plus quest um, um, case basically says just the internal functional role under determines content because look here's a case where two different content attributions are equally compatible with the internal functional role and there are more problems um, also with internal functional role views but but anyways yeah um, so I lost track of the the other question that you asked Philip <laughs> Are you saying you just you don't like this objection so much? Oh yeah, I don't love it. Um, I like it for the I like the plus quest um, and other kinds of okay. uh, uh, indeterminacy challenges for um, for the internal functional role view. Um, I think they're more successful there. Um, I think the tracking theorist might, with some tweaks, be able to uh, to um, to have like a kind of tie breaking rule when there are multiple candidate contents so like to appeal to the more natural content so maybe rabbit is a is a better candidate for a content than undetached rabbit parts so this will have to be built right. in theory so the theory can't just say you represent whatever you track it will have to say you represent the most simple or the most natural thing that you track so you do have to amend the theory um but i think that's possible um, and then they would have to say something else about how you represent the other thing. But I think there are, there are clear, you know, candidate things that are plausible that you could say for how do you represent undetached rabbit parts? Um, somebody like Jerry Fodor, who's a tracking theorist, 
will say something like, well, maybe uh, your, your rabbit representation represents rabbits, but your, um, you represent undetached rabbit parts by having a complex representation that includes rabbit and includes parts and includes the concept of detachment. So, um, so, uh, so maybe there's, you know, there are resources that the tracking theorists can use to slightly complicate their theory, but to get around these indeterminacy worries. I see. Cool. Yeah. So this is, I mean, that's the, for people who, are, this is getting very technical, but people who are interested in this, that's the response, I guess, is due to David Lewis and people like Ted Sider and Robbie Williams, not the singer, Robbie Williams, the philosopher at Leeds. They, they, they add that some, some, some idea that there are some contents are more natural than others. And, and that, that it's, that's um, the fact that they are more natural um, means that, that's what we're more likely to end up thinking. And I mean, you might be suspicious how, how do, that seems a bit magical in its own right, how kind of the fact that they're more natural or appropriate plays a role here. But, why but anyway, to, but yeah. Mm. So why do we have to, why do we have to be so worried about determinants here? Why can't, why can we just accept that it's a, it's an idealization? I mean, we employ idealizations all over the place in, in, in thinking about the world in science. They, 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 it's, I think about the world is riddled with idealizations. Why should our psychology be any different? Um, uh, you know, we, you know, we, we choose one idealization because it works okay. Um, we ascribe certain contents because they work okay. Um, we don't have to sort of, you know, have those underwritten by uh, by some, you know, by the identification of certain fact, facts in the brain that you know show that is precisely the right view to. You know, it's just what works best. Um, what, uh, just realizing that it's an idealization and not expecting too much of it. Um, why, 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 why do we need to worry so much about this? I'm, I'm actually really sympathetic to what you said, except that I think in addition to this idealization, there's also real full-blooded intentionality. Um, so I don't think you can treat intentionality as it's not a mere theoretical posit that we as theorists use to understand other people. It's something that we experience. Mm -hmm. um, it, um, it's something that we're, uh, we're introspectively aware of that the world seems a certain way to me. Um, so that can't be treated as an idealization. But what I'm sympathetic to is once you say that and you also say, you know, once you once you accept phenomenal um, intentionality and you say, OK, that's what what intentionality is all about. You can still accept that there's such thing as tracking relations. Right. Now you can treat those as an idealization mm -hmm. and you don't have to worry about content determinacy and all that. Um, mm -hmm. Because it's not doing this um, it, this metaphysically heavyweight job of uh, of accounting for intentionality. It's doing much less. Mm -hmm. Right now, you don't have to worry about you know all these technical problems um, with these views. You can treat you can treat the mind as a calculator or you know a, a thermometer, mm -hmm. um, and then say you also have consciousness, which accounts for intentionality. But when we talk about the other stuff, we don't have to you know we don't have to worry about the technical problems. We can allow for indeterminacy. I'm very sympathetic to that, actually. Um, you know, I, my earlier life was writing about belief and um, uh, the nature of conscious thought. I, you know, I really want to draw a very sharp distinction between um, uh, conscious thought and the sort of base intentionality that uh, we can make ground in tracking the relations and that sort of thing. And I agree with you that um, that the... <sighs> The sort of contents we ascribe to conscious thought, that the the way we think about the content of conscious thought is is is, is rather different, and it, that it, we do have intuitions about determinacy and so on. You know, of course, I'm thinking about a rabbit and not an undetached rabbit part, and we do need some way of of of, of cashing out that, and we can't just treat that as an idealization. Yes, I'm very sympathetic to that. I think this problem. I mean, I've, I've tried to want I want to do that in a in a in a different way. I think to you, rather than just grounding it to sort of primitive uh, phenomenality, but um, I think you're you're answering a question that needs to be answered. You're addressing a question that needs to be answered. So, I'm certainly to that extent. I'm 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 with you completely. Um, I'm, I'm finding quite a lot to agree with, actually. Um, mm. uh, apart from the the the, the, uh, the robust um, what do you what do you call it, Philip? Robust phenomenal realism is that is it, it's got robust phenomenal realism. Is that, was that your phrase? Just phenomenal realism, I guess. Oh, I thought you said, but I thought there's a notion of robustness somewhere. Oh, you're talking that, about my paper, I suppose. Yeah, that it can't be. It can't be. Um, well, it, it, it's one that you know you can't you, it can't be reductively explained. You can be phenomenal, but it can't be right. Reductive. 
Um, well, yeah, so just, I mean, this might be a good moment. So we've got three objections to the rival view. We've had the mismatch objection. We've had the um, metaphysical sufficiency objection. Yeah. We've, we've had the uh, the more technical uh, determinacy objection. So uh -huh. why? how does Pitt do any better? Yeah. Phenomenal okay. temporality theory. How does uh, Pitt solve these problems? Yeah, great. So, so Pitt says that the most fundamental or basic or original kind of intentionality is nothing over and above phenomenal consciousness. And there are different versions of the view, um, different ways that things can one thing can be nothing over and above another one. They could be identical. There could be a grounding relation, but we don't have to worry about that. Um, it's all about consciousness. Okay, so how do we avoid the problems? Um, so, what are the problems again? First is the mismatch problem. Um, so Pitt. I think has the resources to get the right content attributions in cases like representing redness um, and in other other alleged mismatch cases for the tracking theory, uh, because what you're experiencing in your the phenomenal character of your experience has this reddish quality. Um, it doesn't include all this sophisticated other stuff like dispositions and whatever surface reflectance properties. Um, so it has the right uh, the right character to be plausibly identified um, or to be taken to otherwise realize or give rise to or constitute the content of your perceptual experience. So I think it gets the mismatch cases right, um, which is not to say it gets every case right. So there might still be other cases that you think it doesn't get right. But insofar as the problems that are facing the tracking theory, it gets those cases right. The second problem is the real problem. Um, and here, I think it's it's plausible to say that once you have an experience of redness, this this um, once you have an experience with a reddish phenomenology, you're automatically representing redness. Redness is before your mind's eye. Nothing more needs to be added to your mental state uh, in order for you to be representing redness. And the same goes for other experiences. So once you know, once you've got this squarish experience. Once you've got the phenomenology, you're not missing anything um, in getting the content. Now, I think, again, there might be tricky cases that we might want to talk. We already talked about the case of thought, where I think a lot of the content is going to be derived content. But as insofar as the contents that we can introspectively observe, um, once you got the phenomenology, there's nothing more that needs to be added. There's no gap, right? So that's the second problem. Indeterminacy problems, there's no indeterminacy because what you uh, what you phenomenally experience, your phenomenal um, experiences are fully determinate. So um, there's no indeterminate phenomenology between rabbit and undetached rabbit part or whatever. You experience what you experience. I do think that there is indeterminacy at the level of derived content. Um, right, because what you what you know, what further information is connected to your um, to your phenomenal um, experiences um, might be indeterminate, right? Because it's a dispositional thing. It's what you're disposed to retrieve when you need to. And you might have multiple dispositions that are manifested in different conditions, blah, blah, okay, all that. But I think that's a feature and not a bug. So I think there is there is indeterminacy at the level of derived content, but not at the level of phenomenal content, the of original content, the more basic kind of content. Can we just remind us this distinction between original content and derived content yeah um, so original content is roughly the more the most basic or fundamental kind of content it's content that doesn't constitutively uh, depend on other instances of of intentionality um, so it's intentionality in the first instance derived intentionality is intentionality that does constitutively depend on other instances of intentionality so for example a stop sign, arguably, um, it doesn't represent stop just by itself. Um, it represents stop because we take it to represent stop. We ascribe that content to it or something like that. Some story like that is going to be told where it gets its intentionality in virtue of our originally intentional states, um, our right. intent to use it in certain ways. Some people think that that's how it works for linguistic expressions. They don't represent all on their own, they represent because of how we intend to use them to communicate um, and so on. So there are, it's, it's commonly accepted that there are cases of derived intentionality outside the mind. Pitt, most advocates of Pitt 
many advocates of Pitt um, think that there's also derived intentionality inside the mind too. Right. So it also the word cat only re represents cat, but only in a sort of derivative sense. It depends on our minds. But for you, for the pit person, it all ultimately bottoms out in consciousness that is just about stuff in in a way that's not that's fundamental or the fundamental kind of aboutness. But um, but 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 those conscious symbols may. Uh, also represent may, may also may represent more <laughs> in virtue of how we uh, in, in, interpret them and use them. That's right. They can have yeah. derived intentionality. Yeah. So they as can well. be like like um, um, they can have a similar sort of status to to uh, words on a page or images. Right. Yes, I really yeah. like that actually. Um, I think this, I, the, I think um, uh, this is uh, the maybe an appropriate point to look at some problems for your view. Um, we've looked at some, uh, how you motivate the view and uh, how uh, it uh, has uh, advantages over over the rival views. But what about some some problems for the view itself? Um, and I think we've already, you've already touched on some of the things you will appeal to here to, 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 to address these objections. But I guess the the obvious one is that, well, surely we can have beliefs about the world um, that are not um, when we're not consciously thinking about uh, about about the things. Um, for instance, I believe that Beijing is the capital of China, and I believe that. Uh, I mean, I've just came to my mind now and so I just had a conscious thought about Beijing being the capital of China so presumably there was some sort of some kind of China related uh, content in my in my experience but I believed it before that um, I believe I didn't think about China until just now but I still believed it and I will continue to believe it and if you if I when I'm asleep tonight if someone asks does Keith believe that Beijing is the, the capital of China the answer correct answer will be yes so here we seem to have beliefs with content, uh, with intentionality that are quite uh, independent of experience. How, how does that work, on your view? Yeah. So that. Uh, so we already talked about thoughts, which are mm -hmm. conscious states, and they have derived content that goes beyond their phenomenal content. Uh, the case you're bringing up is a case where you don't even have an occurrent conscious mm -hmm. content. You have only the non-phenomenal content. So how does that work? I think that works in a similar way. It's also a case of derived content. So you, so what it is to have a, uh, what's sometimes called a standing belief, a belief that you're not thinking about at the moment, what it is to have that is for you to be disposed to ascribe to yourself a belief um, with that content. So you take yourself, just like in the case of having a thought um, with an impoverished phenomenal content which you take to stand for some further content. And so you ascribe to that thought uh, the further content in the same way you can ascribe to yourself as a whole, like globally, yourself as a person that for some further content. So hmm. um, across the board, I wanna say that derived representation, derived intentionality is a matter of self ascriptions, ascribing to your internal states, to your phenomenal contents, um, or to yourself as a whole, various further contents. And maybe it's helpful to make an analogy with a book, with derived contents in a book. So a book has sentences and words, and you might say that any one of those sentences and words derivatively represents some content, right? But you might also say the book as a whole has a theme or a, a subject or something like that. And you can ascribe a content to the, so the book can derivatively represent in virtue of your ascriptions, um, a content uh, as a whole. And so we're kind of like books. So we can ascribe to ourselves as persons contents. So that's how I want to kind of unify these, uh, these two different kinds of derived representation and say they're basically doing the same thing. They're a matter of ascribing to ourselves. So once you get outside of consciousness, the contents that you represent are in a certain sense up to you. They're the contents that you take on board, that you ascribe to yourself. Um, and there's no further fact 
as to what are the right contents to take you to have? Like, what beliefs do you have? The ones that you accept and take yourself to have. So, so I, the, what makes it the case that I continue to believe that Beijing is the capital of China when I'm not thinking about it is that if you were to ask me, do you believe that Beijing is the capital of China? I would say, yes, I believe that Beijing is the capital of China. And it's just that disposition to ascribe the belief to myself that makes it the case that I possess it. So it's the disposition to self-ascribe. That's right. I, I, I like that. Um, one one worry though is what what about, like that seems to make these standing beliefs, um, standing state beliefs, dependent on the ability to think about oneself. So what about say, I mean, I want to say that, that my cat has quite a lot of beliefs. It knows what time it's fed, it knows where it lives, it knows uh, it knows all sorts of things. Uh, and we might want to say similarly of babies or young children that they know quite a lot, including when they're asleep, it knows who its mother is and so on, and when mm -hmm. it's asleep. But they if they don't, in the case of animals, they, they, they can't, I, I guess, self-ascribe beliefs. It seems rather sophisticated mental uh, activity to do that. And uh, babies can't yet do it. So does it follow that they don't really have any? Yeah, so two parts of that's a great question. Two parts of an answer. One is, um, maybe it's easier to think about yourself. Maybe you don't have to conceptualize yourself as a human being or a person or a consciousness or something like that. Um, so maybe there's a thin way, a, a less demanding way of thinking about yourself that um, some of these creatures can achieve. But the second thing is to say, if they don't, um, to basically bite the bullet and say, well, they don't get to derivatively represent. And to make that plausible, I would say that derived representation is kind of a luxury. So, you know, you could, you could just have the disposition to accept that Beijing is um, the capital of China or whatever the example was. Um, you could just have that disposition um, and not be disposed to ascribe it to yourself. And that would be pretty much just as useful for getting around in the world as being disposed to ascribe it to yourself. So you can, so these creatures that can't self-ascribe can still do a lot of the, they can still have mental structures where, you know, one, um, one content serves as in some sense a stand-in for another. They use it instead of the other, but then they can retrieve the other, but they're not, you know, they're not ascribing the content of the other one to the first one. Um, and likewise, they don't ascribe contents to themselves, but they're disposed to, you know, to spew out these, these thoughts in certain circumstances. So you can get kind of everything but, and that's good enough from a functional perspective, getting the actual, you know, actually derivatively representing these contents is a luxury. We care about it because mm -hmm. we care about ourselves as thinking, cognizing beings, as rational beings. We care about kind of carrying around all our beliefs with us, even when we're not. <laughs> about that. So we care about that. So we I want this luxury, but it's kind of, it doesn't play much of a role in our day-to-day -day functioning. I, I'm really quite sympathetic to this. I mean, there's a distinction that Daniel Dennett made way back in the in the 70s between belief uh, and opinion, where opinion is this more articulated, determinate, uh, usually linguistically infected kind of state. And it's it's. I really like that distinction. It's something that I I, I wrote my PhD thesis on it, a later book on it, um, and I think there's something. I think that distinction is absolutely essential. Um, and your, 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 uh, the, the phenomenon of intentionality um, theory is an account of content for the opinion style states, I think, rather than the, the um, what then it would call belief states. Beliefs you can ascribe very uh, um, uh, liberally uh, on the basis of behavioral um, uh, evidence, whereas opinions are more reflective states that involve uh, something like a bet on the truth of something. It involves this this kind of uh, articulation of a content and some sort of personal attitude to it. And it's, it's I, I I call this I made use the term super beliefs for these, which they I sort of regret. But I think it's it's it, it does capture something. And so I really like what um, this distinction. As I say, I'd want to 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 tell a somewhat different story about it. But I think it's very important. And this and what I really like about this is the idea that what we have in mind are like uh, just little fragmentary symbols that that then we can do a lot with 
just like um a and i suppose you might you i think about the animals thing there i mean maybe the, the, the my cat can't self ascribe the belief say that um that its feeding bowl is in the kitchen maybe but what it can do is when it hears the sound of uh, um, say the 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 tin, the the tin of cat food being opened it mm -hmm. can run to the kitchen knowing that, that and that's that sort of behavior in response to that kind of stimulus is a similar is some is sort of functionally similar to this self ascription in and serves to uh license our ascription of the ongoing belief that its feeding bowl is in the is in the kitchen so i i think there's a there's an awful lot here that i really like um yeah i mean one way to put maybe something that we agree on is a lot of people want to say that intentionality does a lot of work and it really, really matters, you know, what you're representing because that's what explains your behavior and all that. Um, but uh, at least I would want to say like, actually it, it, it does work, but, um, but there's a lot of other stuff going on that, um, that does a lot of work too, that yeah. doesn't qualify as intentionality. And when we separate out these different jobs, then we can get, you know, better accounts of both of the things. I really like the stuff about derived intentionality. I think it's absolutely crucial. I think that we're, we're, um, uh, you know, the stuff on on paper in front of us, you know, uh, uh, um, it only works once we once we do stuff with it. And I think a lot of the stuff that's in our conscious minds only works when we do stuff with it. Uh, it's it doesn't carry its 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 potential sort of uh, intrinsically. It's what it's what we do with this stuff. And whether you call the the stuff that's present quality or whatever you call it, doesn't that's not I'm, 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 I'm not putting this in your mouth, but that's not the crucial issue. The crucial issue is that there's something there and it's what we do with it that gives it its potency and its cognitive significance. So I think on that, we're, we're pretty close. But I, I think um, maybe Philip wants, is this time for Philip to come in with your with your cognitive fine tuning challenge? Um, yeah, it's going to be me disagreeing again, isn't it? But yeah, um, see, he's, he, I, I he missed it really. Nice one, but he's not. He's... You agree on the consciousness, Philip, right? <laughs> Say again? You agree on consciousness. Keith agrees on the derived representation. Right. Well, I probably agree on the derived representation as well. But no, I mean, I guess my, so I, well, I'm, I, I'm on, on the same side, Angela. You know, I think I share this view. But I think it has crazy implications, crazy implications, which 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 I accept, but which not many uh, people on our side, such as yourself, do accept. So, I mean, basically, I think it raises, there are pretty profound challenges it raises that uh, people who are defending phenomenal intentionality theory, in my view, haven't really focused on yet. So maybe I could just raise um, one issue that I put in a, a paper I've got in Philosophical Quarterly, where I try and raise this uh, cognitive fine tuning problem for people who believe in Pitt. And basically the issue is how come behavior and intentionality are so harmoniously aligned that, that, that they always correlate in a kind of rationally appropriate way? So I, um, let me introduce you to one of my imaginary friends that I talk about in the paper, Inverted Ian, right? So Inverted Ian, uh, from the outside, Inverted Ian um, is, behaves just like a normal human being who really likes burgers and doesn't like being stabbed, as most human beings don't, right? So, you know, every time he sees a burger, eats it and tries to avoid getting stabbed. But... From the inside, in terms of inverted Ian's inner life, right? When he sees a burger, the kind of conscious state he has grounds um, an intense dislike of burgers. But because of the way things work in, in his world, that, that dislike of burgers makes him go and eat burgers uh, and behave just, you know, go, mm, I love burgers and so on. Uh, and then when he, you know, there's a threat of someone with a knife, uh, that gives him the the conscious state that grounds really, really liking being stabbed. But uh, because of the way things work in his universe, that makes him go, oh, no, I don't want to be stabbed and, and, and avoid being stabbed. Right. Um, now, it's, it's inverted in, you know, seems kind of ridiculous, seems kind of incoherent. And I think on something like Keith's view, it would be incoherent because 
I, you know, on, on, on Keith's view or the tracking view or whatever, um, mental states are conceptually bound up with behavior. So like disliking is, is kind of conceptually bound up with avoidance behavior. And, you know, uh, liking something is conceptually bound up with seeking behavior, right? But on, on your view, on our view, that's not the case. There's no conceptual connection because, you know, li liking and disliking um, and other kinds of intentionality state are just grounded in consciousness and it's got no conceptual connection to behavior. You know, we believe in the conceptual coherence of zombies that have the same behavior but don't have any consciousness. So then it's a real mystery. Like, why in the real world do they team up so nicely? When, when, you know, when, when people like things, that makes them go and get it. When people don't like things, it makes them avoid it. That's like, that's like rationally appropriate. Why should that be? And just finally, you know, evolution isn't going to help here. I think maybe pe some people listening might think, oh, well, it's, we've evolved that way. But, um, you know, evolution just cares about behavior. And inverted in would behave, w w you know, would behave just the same. So would it, would creatures like inverted in would have evolved just as well. So the question is, um, it's a prior question to the, to the evolutionary question. It's, you know, why it's about why our conscious states do the stuff they do. Um, and why does specifically, why does what they do make rational sense when, you know, if we're just in a meaningless universe that doesn't give a shit about rationality, uh, why should things align up in that way? So this seems to me, this is uh, one of the big topics in my, in my new book, actually, just a quick plug there. But um, what, can you help me out with this puzzle? Yeah, so I mean, I, I think that the way that you've construed this um, problem really boils down to the problem of mental causation. Um, because I don't think it's implausible to say that there's something about your experience of pain that makes it particularly well suited to playing the pain role. And that because of that, evolution did select pain experience to play this role and not pleasure experience. Um, so um, pain has two aspects. As we know, there's a sensory aspect and then there's a, a normative or evaluative badness aspect. So pain feels like sensorily a certain way, but then it also feels bad. And these two aspects can be dissociated. So maybe the sensory aspect could be inverted and you could have some other experience that plays the sensory aspects role and it would be just as good, that's fine. But the badness aspect seems to, you know, to be particularly well suited, perhaps because of the content that it represents, if you think of it as a contentful state, like this is bad, this is to be avoided, this is, you know, go away, I don't want this or something like that which makes it suitable to be um, to be connected with other mental states that um, like uh, like, you know, beliefs and desires or whatever that have to do with avoiding uh, avoidance um, and that eventually, you know, some part of this will trigger avoidance behavior. OK, so um, if you believe in mental causation, you know, whether you're a physicalist or a panpsychist or an epiphenomenal, uh, not, sorry, not a, a dualist who's not an epi epiphenomenal dualist, um, then, you know, why can't you just say um, th this badness aspect of pain is particularly well suited for playing this role and evolution kind of harnessed um, this power. And that's why um, inverted Ian wouldn't work as well uh, as, uh, as non-inverted Ian. Yeah, so good you make the distinction between the, the, the sensory aspect and the effective aspect and we what well, we we just want to focus on the effective act, aspect i suppose the hurtiness and it's a difficult problem because it, it seems so obvious that hurtiness is going to lead you to avoid stuff right you know it hurts you're going to avoid it but it seems to me that the, the connection but there's no conceptual connection for us for people for someone like keith there would be but for someone like us there's no conceptual connection between hurtiness and a certain kind of behavior rather it's it's a rational connection it's appropriate so it seems to me you do owe us some kind of explanation as to why yeah, so so when you say, oh, well, uh, hurtiness is going to lead you to avoid, and so that's why evolution selects it. But that already assumes that hurtiness, that phenomenal feel, has causal results that are, are appropriate for it. But why, why should that be if we're in a meaningless universe? Why should 
phenomenal feels have the rational results that are appropriate sorry the I, I, I misspoke then have the causal results that are rationally appropriate what well, it should you know it could be equally possible that it causes you to go for something or you know wh wh why you believe in mental causation you're I not do. a phenomenalist okay and no. do you believe that um that particular experiences have particular effects whether that's because you know you're a panpsychist and a kind of panpsychist that says that they're the intrinsic nature of the physical, so there's you know there's a metaphysical, maybe not an intelligible, but a metaphysical connection between um, between uh, experience and what the experience does. Okay, and I'm not I'm not thinking like you know pain makes you lift your arm, but rather pain you know causes other mental states that pull the right string um, that through learning has um, been, you know, through learning and feedback has been um, uh, uh, rigged up to move your arm, something like that, okay? So if you believe in, in mental causation, if you believe that different kinds of experiences have different kinds of causal effects, um, then I think that's, you know, that's gonna be the route to an explanation. But I do grant that the connection between behavior and um, and uh, and experience is probably unintelligible. Um, so if you're a panpsychist, I think it, it, you're 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 stuck with that kind of intelligibility. So why should this experience have this causal effect and not some other, right? Um, if you're an interactionist dualist, you're going to say that you're going to be stuck with these kind of arbitrary seeming, um, you know causal laws and maybe there's you know some reason why um, maybe there's some explanation that is not accessible to us right so but so basically I want to say this is the problem for everyone um, and it's the problem of mental causation the only person who has a, a, a real special problem is the epiphenomenalist dualist because you know there you can't even say that pain does something special that makes it appropriate uh, makes it a good candidate for being recruited by evolution to play the pain role Am I missing something about the challenge? I think so. I mean, okay, there's a there's a puzzle how th how mental states cause stuff and why they cause this rather than that. But let's let's just adopt some solution. I mean, may maybe there are contingent laws of nature that determine what mental stuff does. I think David Chalmers likes that. Or maybe, as you seem to be hinting at, may maybe maybe not. Um, you know, maybe mental state has its its causal impacts essentially. Um, but either way, there's there's a uh, what I'm drawing attention to is this needs explaining. I mean, you know, I I I give it the name because of you know the fine tuning problem that we've we've argued about before. You know, you just why. want to bring in design here, don't you? I know what you want. <laughs> Not design, but you, you know have. something in that ballpark. I think. I mean, where I you know I think this points to. I th I think ultimately we have to say some kind of tendency towards rationality is, is built in at the fundamental level. Uh, not you know not a not a not an intelligent designer pushing things, but uh, some kind of tendency towards what is rationally appropriate. Otherwise, you know, this needs explanation. Why does do, do these phenomenal fields and their causal impacts? Why are the why are the causal impacts rationally appropriate relative to the, the character of the experience? What why should that be? That needs explaining. So I think that is an additional thing to just how do mental states get to do stuff even if we've got a solution to that you've still got the problem why do what they do in the actual world why is it that what they do in the actual world rationally appropriate why are their causal impacts rationally appropriate relative to the the character of the experience how that surely that needs explaining no yes um and i don't think we have an explanation of why particular experiences have the causal powers that they do i don't think we have an intelligible explanation um, that doesn't appeal to brute laws or something like that. Um, I also don't see how appealing to like divine anything or, you know, purpose in the universe or rationality or, you know, that just pushes the problem back. Like why should any divine anything care about rationality, right? Like why, you know, you just, uh, so I don't know, I guess the, the full, the full story of your explanation, but I don't see how that's going to give us a satisfying answer either. I think the more, the better place to to look is to uh, to consider um, whether we can 
you know, look at particular experiences and, um, and see if there's something in the nature of that experience that we can point to to make it plausible that it has the kind of effect that it has. And painfulness involves this experience of badness and repulsion. And, um, and again, I'm not saying that pain directly makes you move your hand from the painful stimulus, but it's the kind of state that plausibly will interact with other contentful states to try to remove itself. So it's like, you know, get rid of me, right? It's a get rid of me kind of state. So, and pleasure is the opposite. It's like more of this, this is good, keep going. This is, this is, it, it would be careful here because if you push this line too far, you end up becoming something close to an illusionist where it's what you're really tracking is, is, is is the effect that things are having on you, um, you know? And it's it, it's painful because it's having this effect. It's not having this effect because it's painful. You know, it's just painfulness is just a way of talking about the impact of stuff on you. Um, so anyway, but there, there is another way of getting out of this problem. And I think if you push the the explanatory issues too far, then it does tend to undermine um, uh, the phenomenal realism. But yeah, you know, that's my hobby horse, so I won't push it. But I think you're in dangerous. You see, Philip wants to push the explanatory worries so that he can get some sort of teleology into things. You see, but if you push the if you push the teleology if you push the explanatory thing too far, then there's a danger you're going to underwrite the phenomenal realism because it's very hard. To, you know, you're going to. Well, anyway, I won't. I won't. I won't push this. But you see where I'm going. I mean, so there's another view, right? The like, as Philip says in in his paper, the functionalist doesn't have this problem because the functionalist says that um, that. Uh, that consciousness is determined by, it's nothing over and above playing the functional role. So they identify you know, the conscious state with the functional role. Um, but I wanna have the other order of explanation, mm -hmm. right? So I don't think we slip into that view unless we reverse the order of explanation. I think the mm -hmm. functional role is explained by the conscious experience that it is. I mean, your, your brain goes to great lengths to create this, um, you know, to create your experiences. I think it's it's implausible to say that um, that which experiences you have don't affect the functioning um, of your brain and your dispositions to behavior, at least narrowly construed. So I think I would go the mental causation way while granting that we don't have, you know, that there's an explanatory gap between um, between you know between the being of consciousness and the doing, right? There's there's a conceptual gap there and. That's something for you know, for anybody who accepts mental causation who's not a functionalist or a physicalist to worry about. That's sure, surely, Angela. Surely, there's an extra problem here. It's not just yeah. So there's one problem. How you know? How does how, how do how, how do mental states get to be get to cause anything? How do they get to be connected up to a particular causal impact? Right. Okay. So that's one thing. But then when you find actually in the real world the causal impacts they have. Are really rational, really rationally appropriate. That's an extra problem because it's like, oh, why were they really rationally appropriate when they, it's, for all we know, through reasoning, it could have been absolutely anything. And so that you know, that that seems like an extra problem to just how do they get to do stuff? How do they? Why do they do rationally appropriate stuff? Surely it's that's only a problem, problem because of the way you've conceptualized the things that need explaining. But anyway. Well, I appreciate if you have your view, Keith, you avoid this. This is how I get this crazy stuff published. You're asking, questions that motivate as a my, you're asking questions that motivate my view. I mean, how can I not like that? I set this stuff. I always set it up as a condition. How am I going to get past peer reviewers with this? Set it up as a conditional. If you believe pits, you have cra you end up somewhere crazy. So the reviewer, someone like Keith, could say, oh, yeah, nice. But then I, uh, but I accept the antecedent. Anyway, sorry, Angela. Go on. I I'll let you have the last word. I'll let you have the last word. Yeah, let, 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 let's let Angela reply. Well, let's see. What should the last word be? Um, so... I want to at least try to shrink the problem um, to what I think would be more manageable cases. So, um, so first of all, I think there could be um, there could be what you call mix and match cases. Um, there could be inverted inversions that are functionally just as good. So maybe like your experience of left and right. If you completely inverted your experiences of left and right and your concepts of left and right, which um, might piggyback on the experiences in terms of getting their derived contents from the experiences. Okay, so you invert everything completely and um, and then you uh, you invert your behavioral dispositions too because um, you can see how like a learning process would hook things up in the right way so that you know you reach this way and then 
Like let's say you were inverted overnight. Um, you would eventually learn to reach the other way because it's just not rewarding anymore to reach the wrong way to, to get things, okay? So you could, you know, maybe it's arbitrary which way is left and which way is right or up and down. You could have inverted cases like that. That would be just as good. And then in terms of what there's evolutionary pressure um, or developmental pressure um, to um, to settle on, which, which, you know, the two inverted sets of experiences you you um, use, it's arbitrary. It could have been one, it could have been the other, you settle on one randomly and then that's just what it is. So I think a lot of um, a lot of our experiences could have been inverted like that. If you think a lot of thought involves um, just verbalizing words to yourself. So which words you verbalize is arbitrary. You could have used different, um, different word forms to, um, to, to represent different things. So you could have like, you know, total like inverted case of language the language that you think to yourself in. Um, so that would be fine. So I think a lot of inversion cases are cases that we don't need to rule out. We can just say we arbitrarily fix on one or the other. To whittle down the problem a little bit more, the connection with behavior, I think, depends what you mean by behavior, but I don't think it's as rational as you might think it is. So if you think that you reliably misrepresent the world in experience a lot of the time, then, you know, let's say like, um, I'm like, here, Philip, choose a candy. I have three candies and one of them is red. Um, and and uh, you're like, I like red, so I'm gonna take the red one. So you form an intention to take the red one. You perceptually experience one as red. You form an intention to move your arm to take the red one. And then you, you do, and you're like, yes, I got it. You're like, my desire is satisfied. Um, you believe all that, but really you took the one that reflects you know, light at such and such wavelengths and not one that's actually red. So it's not really your behaviors that are around, your behavior is, is not matched up correctly to your behavioral intentions, but what needs to be matched is your mental states. So your intentions match your expectations of your behavior um, and they match your judgments of success. So this is where the matching needs to go on. And this matching I think can be explained without even talking about content per se, because there's this representation of redness that we can construe as just a brain state or a syntactic state, and it's overlapping in all these cases. And you can do it kind of like syntactically, like you, you know, you go for the redness and you expect there to be a redness, and then you, it doesn't matter if it's redness or if it's something else, as long as it's the same representation in all cases. So this is just to say, I think we can whittle away the problem um, a lot, um, and uh, and be left with only a problem of mental causation at the end of the day. Okay, sounds good. Um, maybe just so for the like, we're going on a couple of hours, but if, I think it would be good to talk a little bit about the connection with Pitt and panpsychism and illusionism, and then if you have time for a little bit of Q and A. So maybe we could just, um, I mean, not just on 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 panpsychism. I mean, so as has just been revealed in our discussion, or although. Um, partly revealed, I guess, although Angela's a panpsychist. I mean, people tend to think panpsychists have sort of, um, you know, spiritual views or, I mean, less and less people think that, but but actually, you know, a lot of people defending panpsychism are, you know, resolutely secular atheists. Uh, and I think Angela definitely falls into that camp. I mean, you're a value nihilist, if you don't mind me saying, don't believe any facts about value or, so it's, it's you know, there's no no fluffiness going on here. It's uh, it's just a thought, you know, consciousness is real. We need an explanation of it. But anyway, maybe I could just invite you to say, you know, maybe briefly, uh, we're not gonna have too much time to go into it, but what, what, what why you think panpsychism is an attractive view and, and do you think it has any connection to pit phenomenal intentionality theory? Yeah, um, yeah I mean, I'm definitely attracted to panpsychism. I think if I had to bet on what's the right theory of consciousness, that would be it. Um, I definitely want to say that consciousness is is a real thing, that we're acquainted with it, that it's probably the only thing that we're you know directly acquainted with. It's non-negotiable that you know that we include it in our worldview, um, our grip on you know on on the physical, on anything outside of our mind is more tenuous. So I'm attracted to this kind of you know. Russellian um, intrinsic nature's argument that um, at best what you're justified in believing about the physical world is its disposition to impact you in various ways. And then from that, you hypothesize that there are different you know, structures um, that do that, but you have no information 
um, that directly bears on what is what is the thing that has these causal dispositions um, to impact you and you know to 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 evolve in, in certain ways that eventually will impact you. Um, but you are a bit of of matter. Um, and you can, this is just the, the intrinsic natures are, you can introspectively observe what it is to be that bit of matter and its consciousness. So the simplest view is that that's the intrinsic nature of everything, um, you know, rather than saying there's some other intrinsic nature that, that other things have. Um, so that's just the, the kind of standard, you know, intrinsic natures argument. I think it's a good argument. Um, I think, uh, I think, Thinking of uh, of intentionality as largely reliably misrepresenting the world feeds into that argument because um, it basically shows you that insofar as the qualities you ascribe to things are concerned, you're mostly wrong. What you do get right is at best the structure of reality. So um, this is a road to the kind of um, structuralism about what we're justified in believing about the physical world. Um, why is this view? Uh, why does this view fit well? Let's say with Pitt, um, because you can just say all there is in reality is consciousness. That's all that intentionality amounts to. It's just consciousness, um, and it's just consciousness doing stuff. And what you're left with is, well, how does consciousness do stuff? And why do particular experiences do what they do? Okay, how do you fit these two, two pieces of the picture together? It's not just like a static conscious state, right? We know that consciousness changes, that you, know, that you have different experiences and they evolve over time. Um, how do they change? How do they impact each other? That's, that's a question. And uh, that goes back to the fine tuning thing, right? So we're gonna have to answer this question anyways, so maybe we can put it to the service of answering the fine tuning objection too. Anyway, so I think that's where, that's where the the, you know, one of the interesting remaining questions is how do you how do you explain, um, can you intelligibly explain why experience behaves the way that it does? Brilliant. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I mean, I get and connecting it. I mean, I think there is a an important connection also to. To illusionism, maybe Keith disagrees with this, we'll see, but but um, insofar as I guess Pitt, if one accepts it, does seem to rule out illusionism about consciousness, just because um, if we if we or at least at least you can't con you can't consistently believe illusionism because if 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 belief if believing something is just a matter of being phenomenally conscious in a certain way, or if belief is grounded in phenomenal consciousness, then you can't consistently believe you're not phenomenally conscious i well, think this you, is you, could, you could have you could you could believe it i mean uh, the belief will be false yes you're you true, you're true. believe you, it if you, you have the right, right sort of state of phenomenal uh intentionality that fair that, point that, you, you that couldn't you couldn't truly believe, that, believe that, it that, that, illusion, just but be, i think just wrong, just say we, I, I, I think yeah i think this is important because i think a lot of people when i teach illusionism and say the kind of thing galen strawson says you know it just doesn't make sense like Who's believing? Who's who's the the illusions? Who's subject to the illusion? I I I think maybe these people are implicitly assuming something like Pitt, because yeah, I mean if 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 mental representation is grounded in consciousness, then you can't represent that you're conscious without being conscious. So that's why Pitt rules out illusionism. But if you reject that, like I presume Keith would, if you just if if you have don't know tracking view, functionalist view, whatever. If representation is not dependent on consciousness, then sure, maybe you can represent that you're conscious when you're not conscious. I mean, it does, illusionism is still crazy, but uh, you know, it it doesn't have that total doesn't make sense kind of vibe that I think a lot of people attribute to it. And I, I suspect the people who attribute it to that uh, are assuming something like Pitt, which I mean, Galen is a proponent of. I don't know. If I don't know. I mean, I don't. I don't know. I think that they they. No, I think. I don't think their worries are specifically about phenomenal intentionality. I think they're just, it's just, they think, you know, I'm denying that, you know, people feel pain <laughs> and uh, see, you know, have, see red and so on. They think I'm saying people are blind and deaf and uh, they don't taste and smell. I think that's what they, that's what they think rather than what I'm actually doing, which is offering a different account of what it is to uh, feel pain and uh, taste and smell. And so on. I'm not sure the worries come from 
I mean, I mean, the core of illusionism is simply the denial of phenomenal realism. I mean, the appeal to uh, representations and so on comes in where you try to give an alternative story of what's happening, not in the actual denial itself. So what you're saying is if, if, if representation itself and intentionality itself requires phenomenality, then I can't tell that alternative story. Uh, I'm sure I wouldn't be able to, but then there'd be no need to tell it because if, if, if the phenomenon intentionality theory is right, then the first part of the claim is, is wrong. There isn't, you know, the, the, the denial part is, is wrong. So, I mean, it's, 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 it's the denial of phenomenal realism that's, that's the issue, not whether I can tell an alternative representational story, I think. Um, though, actually, I think your point was somewhat sympathetic to me, so maybe I shouldn't quarrel with it. I'm not quite sure there. I mean, but it, certainly, it, yes, sorry. Right. I mean, it, it hinges on whether you believe in consciousness in the sense that I need it, that I think that mm. um, that we need it in order to, to ground our thought. Um, mm. So if you believe in that kind of consciousness, then you could, there's space for a view where you falsely believe that you have a different kind of consciousness. Yes, of yes, exactly. and so maybe that's your view. Um, but if, if you don't believe in the kind of consciousness, if you think that, you know, that what you believe in um, doesn't rise to the full-blooded, you know, consciousness that would be required for Pitt. Um, then, then I agree with Philip that that you know you can't believe that you're not you can't falsely believe that you're not conscious because in believing anything you have to be conscious. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, Yes, obviously. I mean, obviously, I need an account of belief that doesn't that doesn't you know it's rooted in phenomenology. Obviously, uh, just as I need an account of illusion that doesn't involve something like you know the Cartesian theatre. Ob obviously, um, uh, so. But uh, to what extent those sort of I think those those circularity worries are just kind of begging the question against illusionism. Not that to say that illusionism's uh, right or even you know plausible, but those circularity things don't don't do anything because. Obviously, I'm not going to make use of the resources that I've just whose existence I've just denied. Um, now, maybe without those resources, I can't do it. Okay, but I'm not going to be stupid enough to try to use them in actually telling the story. So, you know, so circularity isn't going to get me. But just playing, you know, it's daft, might. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I don't think it's begging the question if you have an independent argument for for Pitt. So, if you have an independent argument for Pitt, then you know, then either you have to deny, you know, deny Pitt. Or if you accept it, then the view is incoherent. As long mm. as the kind of consciousness that you need is the kind. Mm. The, 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 the denial of Pitt just comes under the general denial of phenomenal realism, though it's just a, a sort of lemma of that uh, general general denial, isn't it? But, um, but doesn't it doesn't it add force? I mean, what Angela's given lots of arguments today, like you know, look the, the other theories well, misrepresent, mismatch, misre but, 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 get wrong what we represent. So here's a theory that solves all the problems. I, I, uh, and I, it gives us an extra motivation for phenomenal realism. That's that's that's, that's a nice that's a nice point. I do actually. I, I said earlier that I think Angela's addressing a real a real um, a real a real problem. You know, the, the nature of the intentionality involving conscious thought. I think that is it, it is an interesting problem, and I think that's one that what she raises about tracking and so on are good worries. Um, and so you know, you could plug phenomenal realism in there as one solution, and. Sure, I need a different solution, um, but I, I do agree that a solution is needed, and I think I, I think I can tell a story, and I've tried to do different things. But um, but I, I I'm, I'm certainly not uh, I, I'm not denying the that there's a need for a story there, but obviously I'm going to say a different story. So uh, yeah, I'm, insofar as insofar as Angela's arguments are arguments against the. The alternatives, then I can I can agree with that. I just don't uh, uh, um, adopt the same positive story. I'll put it this way: I think there are other alternatives. <laughs> yeah, that's what it sounds like. Yeah, I but I I think I don't know how to see how you respond to the mismatch view. It it seemed to me from your argument, and that's why I wanted it to continue. It seemed to me that the mismatch worry seemed to apply to the kind of views you like, Keith, as well as. So, so why don't you accept the mismatch argument and um, well, uh, become um, a phenomenal realist so you can avoid the problem? No, hang on, um, just articulate that for me. Why, why does the why does the, why is the mismatch argument going to? Oh, me? I don't know. I can't remember. I mean, I'm losing it now. I, Angela, I can, what did I, you say again? 
Sorry, what, um, so what, what is your positive view, Keith? Of, of, of what? <laughs> what sorry, of, 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 of the uh, content of conscious thought. Yeah. Oh, color or color red, you know, how do, how do we avoid, how do we get it right that we represent well, Edenic I, I red? Right. I agree with Angela that we need to, that we need to, to distinguish two kinds of, of intention, two kinds of content, the content that's involved in what I would call subpersonal representation which is the kind of stuff that gets us around the world most of the time and uh, the, the content that's involved in, in conscious thought. And I think, and I think the, the, the idea that conscious thought involves something like uh, 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 personally available symbols, either written on a piece of paper or uh, imaged. And I do believe in mental imagery. I just don't think mental imagery is, is phenomenal in that sense. Uh, 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 it, so I think conscious thought involves these symbols. And I agree with a lot of the stuff about the, 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 the derived, derived intentionality because the, these things are affordances, uh, co uh, cognitive, um, the, the cognitive tools, things that we we uh, um, that we can use to do things cognitively with these these, these symbols. So I'm, I'm really happy with that. Um, now, so but what do I say about the so which which we're we talking about here? The the red uh, as something that's being sort of a feature of the world that's being tracked by our brains for uh, for various adaptive purposes, or the red that figures in my conscious thinking to myself that I'm currently having an experience of red. How, how, what's your view of original representation of original intentionality? Origi I don't. I don't really think. I don't think I believe in original intentionality. I think. I mean. I'm. I'm basically a Donetian. I think that. Uh, in, uh, you know, I, I'm an intentional systems person. I think that these are all idealizations. I don't think that there's there are determinate facts about content. I think that we do tend to think of conscious contents as determinate, but that is to do with the fact that we can unpack them in various ways and do stuff with them that resolves the indeterminacy. But I don't think there are any uh, uh, fixed facts about content independently of our interpretations there. I'm very, very and that would go with things like red as well, actually. Interpretations are not originally representational either, right? The, the, what aren't they? The interpretations are not. It's not like no. It's all, it's, no, it's, all, it's all part of a web of interpretation. No, I don't think there's there's any. I don't think there are any intrinsic facts about intention. I don't think it come, the interpretation, you know, the, the ground uh, uh, bottoms out in some in some uh, intrinsic intentionality. No. no. Mm -hmm. So basically, it just boils down to. Um, intentional systems theory predicts our behavior. Uh, I mean, putting it very simply, um, it's that you know the intentional systems theory is useful, but then you start building all sorts of things on top of it, particularly with with creatures like ourselves who are reflective and can uh, do all sorts of self manipulations. And so that the intentional systems theory gets intentional idioms sort of puts them to work in the world. But then there's all sorts of bells and whistles that we build on with our, with our self, their self reflective abilities. And the, the problem is, I think that we project features of this rather elaborate, constructed kind of intentionality onto intentionality in general. And we think that that's the, the, the I think we do this generally with the mind, we take we reflect on features of our conscious mind, I think these are features of mentality per se. And we sort of project them downwards and take them to uh, too seriously in a way. And this is why I like to talk about illusions. It might, we could almost talk about constructions instead of illusions. They're, 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 they're theoretical fictions that we create to, un to, to not just to understand our own minds, but also to do things mentally um, to help with certain sorts of um, mental activities that we engage in. Um, and, but I don't, I don't believe in treating them, t treating these descriptions and the, as too seriously, because I think then you get into all kinds of problems which you really don't need when you, the important thing is to look at what we're doing with these descriptions um, and what they're for and what they enable us to. So it's, it's, it's a very sort of activity oriented view of the mind. Um, and things are what we do with uh, mental things are what we, what am I trying to say? Um, uh, I'm, I'm trying to say mental things are what we do with them, but that doesn't really come out as a, coherent English sentence and I'm not sure I can do much better at this point. Should we let Angela have the last word and then we go to Absolutely. Q Absolutely. Last word. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's, there seems to be a bit of a tension in what you're saying because, you know, you're saying, you know, and then we we project these, um, you know, these, this mm -hmm. theoretical construct or whatever, this, you know, theoretical mm -hmm. thing. Um, and we interpret it as being more than it is. Um, mm -hmm. But are all these projections and interpretations themselves intentional? So is it just more intentional systems theory all the way down? It bottoms out in intention. These things are going to obviously have to bottom out in intentional systems. Uh, uh, you know, that's 
Yeah. Ultimately, that's what it's going to bottom out in terms of the the, uh, the subpersonal stuff. Yeah, that's that's you know you do it by making this the ex uh, the um, um, the explanands simpler than the explanandum sort of. Yeah. Yeah. So I think ultimately, the, this this kind of view is going to face all three of the worries that that um, that other views face. So indeterminacy, there could be more, and Dennett embraces that. There could oh, be. Oh, I embrace that too. Yeah, definitely. It's more an illusion of determinacy, or a, a sense, or or, or, or or the fact that we can resolve. The thing is, whenever we have indeterminacies in conscious thought, we can do something to resolve them, which gives us the impression that there was always some prior fact to the matter. Um, no. Anyway, sorry, you're supposed to be having a lot. It's hard to interpret all these 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 mental claims, these claims about mentality. It as just saying, you know, the intentional systems theory that ascribes to us the illusion of determinacy that predicts our behavior, um, because it really sounds like you're wanting to say, like, and I experience this as an illusion or something like that, or I, I, I you know, I currently experientially believe that there's an illusion, right? Um, so. Yeah. But you don't want it. You don't want to be interpreted that way. So I think then. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm happy for it all to be webs of interpretation, and also to all to be socially linked. I don't think it's. I, I, um, I don't think it's all just sort of grounded in me, in my, in my immediate experience. It's grounded in me interacting with the world and with other people, and with talking about myself to other people. And it's all a much more sort of. <laughs> I, I, it's it, it's it's. It, there's a sort of radically anti-Cartesian sort of strand to all of this. It's about me being part of a much wider system of uh, of, uh, of of interpretation and uh, construction, I suppose. Yeah, so I'm going to be worried that there's still going to be indeterminacy. Like, so if somebody's like behaving irrationally, then maybe um, there's actually a, a rational um, set of beliefs and desires, mm -hmm. and intentional states you can ascribe to them, um, but. Uh, introspectively you are going to want to say that's the wrong answer and you don't you don't accept that there's introspection um i think there's going to be a kind of metaphysical sufficiency problem too so like how can the fact that intentional systems theory predicts my behavior make a content present to me um makes the content entertained by me um, well, it, and then yeah. i think there's going to be mismatch cases that you end up ascribing the wrong contents to preserve rationality, because this is what intentional systems theory has to work with. I think it's all much, much, much looser and sort of uh, than, than we than we imagine it to be. I mean, as I say, I think determinacy is a sort of illusion again, that because we can do things to resolve indeterminacy. It's like the fridge light; you know, we, we think it's always on because when we open the door, it is. Um, but all these things like introspection and uh, presentation and acquaintance and so on, I'm not. I won't. I wouldn't. Deny, I'm not saying nothing's happening. You know that there's nothing going on there. I just don't think what's going on is quite what we naively, or perhaps not so naively, perhaps more philosophically, uh, take it to be. So I'm going to in all of these cases, or every case where, oops, sorry, where I want to say something's an illusion or a construction or whatever, I, I want. Or, 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 or just to eliminate it. I want to replace it with something else. I'm not just going to say, "Oh, it doesn't exist. There's no, no such thing as that." Yeah, that, that would be that would be that would be crazy. And I want to say it's not the way you're conceptualizing it's wrong. There's something here, and it's more like this. And it's so it, intrinsic intentionality, intrinsic as it were, phenomenality. I want to get rid of those, but I want to say there's you know there's something happening there, and I want to tell a story about that. But it's it's. I mean, I, I suppose maybe what it comes down to in a way is not wanting to treat any aspects of the mental as fundamental, another pun there. Um, uh, 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 so maybe that is, I, I, and I resist that just because it seems unexplanatory to say, you know, there's just this thing there and that just grounds it all. And you've just got to accept that it's there and how it comes about, maybe we can tell some, uh, make positive brute identities or some sort of emergence laws or we can say it's fundamental to everything or whatever but that's unexplanatory and that's what really what really gets me I want to know how it works but I'm having the last word now instead of you and so I'll, I'll, I'll stop now and let you okay <laughs> the very last word and so I think that gives us a lot of common ground to work with actually so we both agree there's something there mm. we can introspectively observe maybe but we might not know what its nature is just by introspectively observing it. Absolutely. Um, and Absolutely. we can theorize about it and see yep. if we can come up with a theory that explains what we do introspectively observe. Absolutely. And that is what I need to get a foothold so I can run the mismatch problem. 
Um, you know, so so once you've got that, then you're like your theory has to answer to this thing that you introspectively observe. And now you know we can start arguing about whether you know whether your your theory does, you know. And, and I'm not committed to, I mean, I mean, I I I am, but not as a you know as a, an advocate of Pitt. I'm not committed to mm. consciousness being fundamental. No, um, no, no. Okay, but um, but I am committed to it being um, you know the grounds of intentionality. So we can you know we can talk about mm. that. That could even be compatible with the kind of functionalist physicalism you want to have. But mm. but. Once we've got the phenomenon we want to explain, and we can both point to it, uh, we can argue about how to describe it, and we can, you know, we can argue about how to account for it. Yeah, yeah. So I don't think, I, I, yeah, it's this identifying the phenomenon. I, I think, yes, yeah, we, can, we I think what we're doing is gesturing very loosely at something. But anyway, uh, I think there's a there's a lot of common ground certainly in the questions we're addressing, and I, I think that's. That's so I, I thought Angela was going to say, oh, we agree then. But actually, I'm glad that she actually showed how, given the agreed starting point, Keith's view still does fail on, on all three counts that have been outlined. So I think that's a nice a nice point to end on and, and move to the Q&A. Yes, um, yes, okay, so people have some questions. Digital Gnosis asks, which premise of the Pruss Kuhn's modal contingency argument for God's existence does Angela reject? I think that's just a joke. We'll, we'll, we'll skip over that uh unless you unless you want to answer that no no okay so katka i think came up first oh sorry what did you say somebody wants to you know present the argument i'm not familiar with it no he's just, he's just being silly i think he's uh but this is not this is not the topic of discussion um not that i'm sure angela could address it if if she if she if, if we had been talking about it okay katka slutova asked uh the first question i think do panpsychists differentiate between different levels of consciousness okay so we've gone for the uh the oh i don't think that was the first question but anyway answer that and then oh no this was katka's first question um no no go on answer that sorry i've got a mess answer that question and then i'll find the first question what do we mean by different levels of consciousness here so some panpsychists will say that you've got more fundamental experiences and less fundamental experiences and maybe the less fundamental ones are made up of the more fundamental ones. Um, so some say that. Um, then, of course, there's a problem of how does that work for, for many versions of panpsychism. That is the combination problem, right? How do you get less fundamental experiences out of more fundamental ones? Um, I think for Phillips, cosmopsychism, maybe it's a kind of decombination problem. Um, but uh, definitely there's... An explanatory burden there for the panpsychist if you if you have a view like that other versions of panpsychism might say you know all conscious experiences are fundamental um so maybe a kind of fusion view might say there's you know maybe there are causal connections between um between you know between simpler and more complex uh experiences but the more complex ones aren't just nothing over and above the simpler ones put together so they are in a sense fundamental um, i'm actually attracted to that kind of view because i think the combination problem is um, insolvable and that if panpsychism were true it should be solvable um if, if, if combinationism were true it should be solvable so i don't know if that really addresses this question of different levels of consciousness for panpsychism but there's some stuff about it <laughs> Um, Digital Notes had another question about um, sl maybe slightly more on topic about what you think of Alvin planting as evolutionary argument against naturalism, which he might be raising because it, I guess, it's sort of similar to my fine tu cognitive fine tuning stuff. But do, are you familiar with that, or or um, or not? Can somebody quickly summarize it? Um, I guess it's just evolution. Evolution. Um, is cares about survival not 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 content um not content basically not what content we're entertaining and so if we assume that we're just the products of evolution we should assume our beliefs are unlikely to be true because evolution doesn't care about i mean i actually might want to write a paper on this because i think what he i think i, I think he's assuming something like pit or his argument kind of doesn't make sense i mean if you're a functionist or something is he doesn't say he's assuming Pitt, but it seems like if you're a functionist, the argument would just fall away. But I can see 
so it's kind of it's kind of similar to my point i think it's if if you know we, we entertaining content is sort of logically separate from behavior evolution just gives a shit about behavior How, you know we should expect that all our beliefs are wrong because there's there's no evolution there's no evolution wouldn't care about our beliefs being true evolution cares about us behaving as though we've got true beliefs but not actually entertaining true contents what do you what do you think about that it's kind of a similar argument oh i think evolution cares if you believe in in mental causation this goes back to our discussion about fine tuning if you believe in mental causation evolution cares about which mental states you have okay but it doesn't care about them being true uh, because you could be reliably misrepresenting i think you are in fact and that's just as good perhaps better um, than veridically representing the world as it is. There's no evolutionary pressure to get things right. I totally agree with that. Um, but I, but I, I don't know if this is a point of disagreement oh, right. or if this is this is part of a. Well, why? But then, oh, so what? 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 Plantinger infers from that is is that we should. Oh, sorry, I spoke over you then, Angela. Did, no, I was just repeating what. I, so you know, evolution cares about what you represent, but it doesn't care that it's true. But what? But then why? Sh so what? Plantinger wants to infer from that is that you can't coherently believe i mean you should just doubt all of your belief you know what you should just assume all all of your beliefs are false um you, you, it's irrational to sort of trust your beliefs or you, you, you your beliefs are more likely to be false than true including your beliefs about evolution or any scientific beliefs so why doesn't this undermine all our scientific beliefs i think that's the thought yeah i mean that goes back to some of our discussions so i think it undermines a lot of your perceptual beliefs um, but uh, you can kind of bootstrap your way out of there um, by thinking, you know, that some of the, 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 if you're reliably misrepresenting the world, then some structural relations between your beliefs and your experiences might map onto real, you know, structure, structural relations um, out there in the world, even if the particular qualities in, that you ascribe to the world are, um, are even if that's wrong. So you can be right at the level of structure and wrong at the level of the things that have the structure. I think that's where we're at. Okay, another Quido has another as a question on panpsychism. Is your view what it in your view what is the relation between panpsychism and idealism? Is it a form of idealism? What do you think of the combination problem and what do you think of cosmopsychism i know the way angela you've said to me before the way you like to phrase the intrinsic nature problem is in a slightly more idealistic way than it normally is yeah yeah so sometimes people describe panpsychism as um as saying that consciousness fits in fits, it, consciousness is the intrinsic nature of the physical um i think it might be better to describe it as the physical is the causal dispositional shadow of the mental or something like that. So what there is, um, is consciousness and it does stuff. So if that satisfies your concept of idealism, then yeah, that's a kind of idealism. Um, it's not idealism in the sense of, you know, everything that exists is an idea in my mind or in the mind of God or something like that. So it's not a kind of, you might call that a kind of like phenomenalism. It's not that view, um, but metaphysically speaking, everything is you know, an idea, it's mental and it does stuff. And maybe you also want to say there's, um, you know, some kind of like space time structure in which it does stuff. Um, so maybe you want to accept something like that, too. What maybe. about cosmopsychism? I think you like cosmopsychism, don't you? Or, or I like the combination problem? Uh, <laughs> or. Um, yeah, we already said about the combination problem. Um, I, I like cosmopsychism more than a kind of micropsychism that's committed to combinationism because I don't think that we can intelligibly explain mental combination, but I think that we should be able to if combinationism were true. Um, so I don't think you can appeal to kind of ignorance there to, to hide your, uh, you know, why you can't, you know, intelligibly explain mental combination. Um, the kind of worries I have with cosmopsychism are you know how do you how do you get isolated experiences out of the cosmic hole, um, and you know when that when that happens, does cosmopsychism predict that? Like let's say I'm experiencing red. I mean, this is a question for you, Phil. I'm experiencing red. Um, on your view, the cosmos is experiencing red, and I'm experiencing red. I'm a part of that, right? Are there two experiences of red, or just one? 
Um, I well, I've defended a couple of different views. I, I think we could make sense of both. That there's, we could make we could make sense that there's a well, the two things I've defended. Thinking on the spot now, remembering my views that we could make sense that you both share. There's one experience that you both share. Luke Roloffs and I have, have written a paper defending phenomenal sharing that we can both share the experience. So you might imagine two conjoined twins sharing the same headache. Or I've also defended the view that um, when human subjects or whatever come into existence, the universe sort of gives up some consciousness. <laughs> And it gets kind of taken over, inherited by the new subject. So, and then it takes it back when they die. Um, but, uh, but what do you think? You you think that's a big problem? Yeah, I mean, I think the first option is a problem because then you've got two experiences. I think you you have to think of yourself as something that is distinct from your experiences to say that you can you can share experiences. So they're distinct subjects, and they each like sample the experience or something like that and then you have to have some kind of you know some kind of that's not compatible with what i think is the most attractive view of subjects which is that they just are bundles of experiences right. um i the see twin twins sharing a headache i th think we might still be able to accommodate that and say that by allowing for kind of like partially unified um you know sets of experiences mm -hmm. um and we can maybe we can maybe we can do that without giving up this kind of like bundle picture of subjects mm. but the universe and me sharing an experience i think that's problematic you know it seems like there's you're ascribing too much conscious too many experiences here than we have you know reason to think exist the second option that um when i have an experience of i kind of like break off from the i think that is you know it's a kind of uh kind of diffusionism or something. So it's, it's, it, it takes all, I think that view t ends up taking all experiences as fundamental, or at least compatible with taking all experiences as fundamental. And then my experiences are no longer derivative from those of the cosmos. So I think that that does avoid the problem. But then I you want like to say that the, the cosmos is unified in that way in the first place, if it's not playing the role of, you know, kind of of, of subserving my, ex of being the source of fundamental experience. You know, why not say it's just a bunch of, why not say it's just a bunch of isolated experiences and then there's the, there's my experience, which is also fundamental. Um, and it's the same on, on the, you know, on this alternative view versus the cosmic, uh, cosmopsychism view, All right? So what, what job is the cosmic consciousness doing on that picture? Um, what what job is the cosmic consciousness doing? I suppose um, I suppose I I would be probably inclined to a view that has more of a separation between the subject and the experiences. So that would be going more more closer to the first option. Um, no, it wouldn't actually. I think even on the second option, I, I I'd still go for something like that view. And then you've got a more unified picture of reality. So you've just got this fundamental streams of experience. That just carry on like the physics captures but then different subjects dip in and out sampling them i think that's a more unified picture of reality um yeah but, now you have subjects hmm? you but, got but, subjects but, but, what, what do you go for then angela what, and what do you think of the combination problem or the decom what, what do you go for i mean so i think there, there are big problems with all the views but uh the but i think what's what i don't want to what I think we shouldn't negotiate on um, is uh, is combinationism and intelligibility um, with respect to any alleged combination. So I would say that all all experience is fundamental, which is compatible with it being complex and having parts. Uh, but it's but no experiences are reducible to their experiential parts. They can you know subsume the parts. But they're still their own fundamental experiences. I don't think you can give a, a combinationist. For a long time, I wished combinationism were true, and you know, I was trying to. I have papers trying to argue that um, maybe it's okay if we can't intelligibly explain it. Maybe there's a way to motivate a kind of ignorance reply. But um, but I, I don't think so anymore. I suppose some people might say at that point, why not be a dualist if you if you think all experiences are fundamental? Uh, because the intrinsic nature is argument. Right. 
So that undermines any, we don't know what the physical is. Yeah. We might as well think it's continued. Okay, one more question uh, from Siversky. Um, any view on who sells accounts? So it's like a different kind of question here, but what, what do you think about who sells accounts? Maybe through the new work of Dan Zahawi, Zahavi, sorry. Relatedly, why believe phenomena are misrepresentational of some inaccessible actual reality? And what could that, and what might that be? Yeah, so I'm going to ask, I guess, to 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 um, say more about what aspects of Husserl and um, Dan Zahavi's work on Husserl um, you're interested in. But for now, I'm going to say something about why belief phenomena are misrepresentational. Um, so, I mean, this goes back to the the mismatch problem um, and uh, and the picture of the mind as reliably misrepresenting the world. So, according to our our best scientific picture of the world, the contents that we represent in perception are just you know are just um, are not uh, the, are are not uh, reflected in reality. So, we experience things as red as being in this 3D space, um, things as being hot and cold, uh, sweet, uh, morally good, uh, all these, you know, all these qualities that we ascribe to things in the world. And when you kind of dig around in it, even if you assume like a kind of like robust scientific realism, you know, forget about the structuralism, um, nothing like that shows up in your scientific picture. So, um, so that undermines that picture. Um, and leads you to a picture on which you reliably misrepresent. So at the same time, the misrepresentation is reliable in that you get things wrong in the same way all the time. So that's why it can still be very useful for getting around in the world. There could still be you know, selective pressure to represent the world in this way. It might even be better than veridically representing the world as actually having complex surface reflectance properties, which might take more representational resources to represent than just simple colors. So you know, so I think that's that's the best picture. That's why I think that that's right. I don't know if we want to follow up on the Husserl thing. Wow. Well, we've been going two hours forty minutes. Um, thanks, Angela. I think that's that's been a really amazing discussion, and I think I think we've really got across to people a good idea of the phenomenal intentionality theory, whether they like it or not. Can I just can I just say one more last point? Oh yeah. Based on the the title, so I was surprised to see the title that you selected for this uh, this show. Oh yeah. Um, because um, at the end of the day, I don't think consciousness connects you to reality, um, and that more work needs to be done by you as a subject in order to pick out things in the world to achieve reference um, and uh, to to. Um, to have determinate truth conditions, conditions in which your mental states are true or false. Um, so uh, I hope nobody. <laughs> so this is this is your thought. What it's important to you that it's not intentionality is not fundamentally a relational thing. It's 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 an intrinsic property, something you have in yourself rather than how you're related to things. Is that is it connected to that? That's right. Yeah, yeah, and that's part of the reason why I don't think it connects you to um, to reality in this direct way. Though you could still have a relational view and still think there's a gap between intentionality and uh, and reference and re connecting to reality. The way I see it is, um, you've got two job descriptions here. You've got thinking and representing the stuff of thought. You know what is the stuff of thought and uh, and intentional experience. What do you think in? What do you entertain? And then there's the question of what do you pick out in the world? And a lot of people think that there's one thing that plays both roles. You basically think in the stuff that you pick out in the world, uh, right? And that's that's what I want to deny and say those are going to be two different parts of the picture. There's what you think in, and then there's how does that get connected to the world? And that's a second part of the of the story. But it's the stuff that you think in that has to get connected to the world in order for this to be some kind of like cognitive, cognitively meaningful connection. I, I don't. How can I find this a bit hard that the that the phenomenal states themselves don't have ac truth conditions or accuracy conditions? It seems like, you know, my phenomen my experience are. Uh, of there being a cup here seems to me to 
represent a cup at a certain distance from me, a cup shape, and, and be true or false, depending on whether there really is a cup at a certain distance from me. So why isn't that my experience itself already having truth conditions? Just so truth conditions are, you know, conditions under which it's true or false, like a like a sentence, the cup is, the snow is white, is true, or if and only if snow is white, that's its truth conditions. What? Mm -hmm. So why, what, why doesn't my visual experience of the cup have truth conditions? Mm -hmm. uh, so because um, you your experience of a cup doesn't relate you to the property, like, you know, the platonic property or whatever you want to say about properties of blueness and cuppedness and whatever, all these properties. Um, so it doesn't, you know, construct a condition out of these properties. Um, you're not acquainted with these properties um, for you to be able to use them in a description or, you know, in some other way, um, use them to, to, to specify some condition the world can meet or not meet. Uh, so this goes back to the non-relational picture of intentionality. It's basically a kind of adverbialism about intentionality. Um, Uriah Kriegel also has this kind of view and he calls it a kind of adverbialism, um, whereby uh, what you've got is intentional states that are certain ways and that's what intentionality is and that's what you're entertaining. Maybe you're entertaining the ways or maybe it's just the entire intentional state that counts as what you're entertaining but it's not a kind of constitutive relation to something that can play the role of truth conditions or conditions of reference or reference themselves. The only exception, and this is how you claw your way out of the mind, the only exception is when you think about your own mental states. Um, there, when you think about your own mental states, I think you are directly acquainted with your own mental states. Maybe you can embed them in your thoughts or you can inwardly demonstrate whatever. Um, and maybe you can also directly pick out and refer to through having intentional states um, their properties and their features okay this is uh, right i don't get this at all so so I, I think we do disagree and interestingly in some way you agree with david papano who was supposed to be the the arch opponent here so his worry is he had like how is con how does consciousness make us acquainted with properties to set up truth conditions but yeah, and I well, think, it, look, yeah, I agree with him yeah. on that. But look, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I guess I'm just, it just seems to me evident that my, 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 my I, I can't make sense of the very phenomenon, the very basic phenomenon of, you know, my experience that, that I, I choose to describe by saying, you know, my experience is about a cup. That seems to me it's, it's accurate or inaccurate, dependent if there's a cup there. Or, you know, my my thought that the queen is um, a wonderful, wonderful woman. Um, that, I don't know how to understand that without it being something that's tr tr taking the world to be a certain way. And so true or false, depending on whether the queen is a wonderful, wonderful woman. Um, I, I just don't know what you... What, I, I just don't get the view. I understand Papineau because he just wants to say really consciousness is just sort of meaningless colors and shapes but i don't get your view that it's 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 phenomenal intentionality it's the thing it's the thing we want to describe as aboutness but it doesn't have any truth i don't get that i just yeah i don't understand it at all oh no i wanted i wanted us to agree go on anyway go on can you so i think what's going on here is I, I i think that you're overly intellectualizing what you're introspectively aware of when you're aware of your intentional state so maybe i'm going to agree with keith again sorry um, <laughs> so i think you can you can point to these states and like look i've got this this okay this entertaining of a content or whatever but you can't be like oh and i can see that it involves a relation to the property of blueness and the property of being a cup and a condition that the world can fail to satisfy or succeed in satisfying I think that's deeply problematic. You don't, you don't, you don't think that in an in ordinary situation. But it seems to me, when you do think it, I don't see. Uh, otherwise, there isn't really aboutness. I mean, once we characterise what aboutness is, I'm thinking about the bloody queen. I'm, I'm that's what. Or uh, you know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm thinking about a red cup-shaped object at a certain distance. I mean, and, and so, you know, like, what if there is no queen? What if there is no property? Yeah, so then, so then it's false. So then, my then my state at the state is false. What if the property of redness doesn't even exist? So let's say you know you 
you don't think that you think that properties only only instantiated properties exist let's say okay um could turn out to be true there's no like uninstantiated properties existing in a platonic heaven or something like that and you don't think anything is red so red isn't instantiated so when you think about redness there's no redness that you're thinking about right um so it, you know it could be like that um, as far as your introspective experience is concerned. So I don't think we can say, you know, like someone like Adam Pouts, you know, and, and David Bourget, I want to say like, you're acquainted with the property of redness when you have an experience of redness. Um, the experience that you're having is compatible with there being no property to be acquainted with. So it's got to be this, yeah, I, you know, internal, completely internal, non-relational state. And then once it's that, just like there could be no queen, right? Once it's that, um, then there is a substantive question of what's the right way for this internal state to connect with reality such that reality answers to it. Um, and there, I think you need to do real work to, to specify which way you want your intentional states to match the world, right? And I have, I, one, yeah. I have one more go at this and then I'll let you have the last word. I mean, I, I, I see that it would be interesting to see you, you and David Papadou talk about this, given that you seem to be motivated by the same thing. And, um, but I, I, I look. I see the challenge, but both when you put it, when he puts, it, you know, and I don't know what to say about it. Maybe, maybe I will end up saying, actually, um, the the properties must exist. Platonic properties must exist, or something for these conscious states, because for for, for these reasons, I don't know. But still, I I just don't understand. I don't know. How, once I try to characterize aboutness, it seems to me involves some kind of reference, if only to properties, some kind of truth or accuracy conditions. Um, I don't know. I don't know what the hell you're talking about. And, and and if it doesn't, then how does it combine with stuff to make truth conditions? I don't even understand. Uh, but yeah, it just seems to me you're giving up on aboutness. Although if you just say it, it. It doesn't have any accuracy of truth conditions or anything. I don't know. Yeah, so it is what it is. Um, and again, this this notion of aboutness, I think it breaks down into two independent notions, um, two independent phenomena. One is the entertaining of contents. And that's what I've given a picture of. And the other one is connecting to the world. And it turns out there isn't just one thing that plays both of these roles. Um, I do have a story of how you connect to the world. Um, and it's it's in in roughly it's uh in terms of the the so i don't think you can get reference from no reference um you need some reference to create more reference okay um and the reference that you do have is reference to your own internal states and their properties and out of the out of that very limited vocabulary you can construct rules or descriptions like criteria of truth and reference or descriptions that can be satisfied or not, which you might merely derivatively represent. So they might live, you know, in your derived contents. I don't think you're going around thinking about them. Um, but if you do that, then maybe there's some hope that you can construct, you know, rules that will um, make uh, your in your intentional states, which don't intrinsically have reference, um, uh, subject to interpretations that you voluntarily accept in virtue of accepting these rules or descriptions. And that's how you can, um, if at all, you can claw your way out of the mind and make determinate contact with that cup on your desk, um, determinate epistemically meaningful contact. Would it, would it be fair to say that on your view that, that there isn't a, a sort of anything that's distinctively intrinsically cognitive uh, phenomenality. There's just phenomenality. There's just experience. And we can use bits of it for cognitive purposes as, as representations. Is that, um, would I mean, that be a fair way of putting it? Because that's sort of, we can sort of, we can use bits of our experiences to, to represent the world, but that's something we do with them, not something that comes built into them. If by represent here you mean refer to, um, then yes. Well, so yes, I I, 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 yes. It's true well, on represent, that gives you derived content, but it's true on the interpretation of reference too, that gives you truth and reference. So I think there, there are two different ways, let's say, you can use your phenomenal states. One, to have derived contents, which are more of the stuff that you entertain, that you're committed to, that's a stuff of thought. Mm -hmm. um, and you can also use them through these 
criteria of truth and reference that you might accept that are built up of things that you can refer to um, or descriptions um, that, uh, so you can also use your phenomenal, um, your phenomenal contents to refer to things as well. So those are two different things that you can do with them. The, the phenomenal content itself, the, 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 the fundamental, uh, it's, 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 it's just like, a, a, Say an image of the queen, or, or or a sound. It's a sound, or it's image. It's just it's 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 like mm -hmm. anything else that might pop into my head at any time, and it's what I do with it that turns it into into an intentional state. Is, is that yeah? Rough? Is that rough? Yeah, rough? roughly, it's how you I, interpret it, how yeah, you yes. intend to have it um, answer to the world, or the world answer to it. Okay, yeah. I don't believe I this. Like it's turning out. That Angela disagrees with me and agrees. This is this is not fair. The world is there is a teleology of the world and it's set against me. Um, I oh. think I'm gonna have to go and feed some children. I think Angela had to go after three hours. I said, Oh, don't worry, it's just gonna be 90 minutes, an I hour and where I where I disagree with Papano too, because yeah. I think Papano and I agree a lot on what sensory experience is like but he doesn't want to go the extra step and say that this is what you're entertaining when you're thinking. This is the content that answers, this is what answers to the kind of, you know, the, the everyday notion of thinking a content, uh, perceptually experiencing something. He goes very close to saying that. So in his book, he says stuff about, well, you have quasi objects and quasi properties in your experience, right? Mm -hmm. So he, want, he recognizes that there's something that looks a lot like content, um, in the everyday sense, but you want to say, no, that's not content. Content is tracking. Um, and I think it's a mistake to, once you've got that view of experience and even the quasi objects, um, that view of, of, you know, maybe taking it a bit further than what Papano wants to say, that view of what it is what, that you're entertaining in your mind. Um, I think it's a mistake to then tack on a tracking theory to that picture. Um, because what we care about when we care about truth and reference is whether what we're entertaining matches the world in some way, not whether there's some distinct tracking relation, um, you know, between our internal states and the world. So this kind of representation that Papineau gives us doesn't make contact with the mind in the way that truth and reference has to. So I think that's where the key disagreement between me and Papineau really is. Fantastic. That is that. That's really, really helpful, and has yeah Absolutely. made me made me really. I need to think more about this stuff. Thank you so much, Angela, for sharing Absolutely. three hours of your <laughs> day with us. It's been a really incredible discussion, a nice climax to season three. Um, yeah. Do you yeah, have any final words? So uh, just yeah. Thanks so much. This was really fun. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, Thank Angela. Thanks, I hope. Sorry, final words. Sounds like you're going to die or something. You're not going to die. I don't, uh, nobody interpreted it that way. I don't know why. Brilliant. Hope to see you soon, Angela. Take care. God, Bye. I, I, kick you out Bye. Now. <laughs> I can't remember how I'd remove you. Oh, there we go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh I'm absolutely... We were going to have a chat. We keep meaning to have a chat about uh, Lambda the sentient. Um, should we just have yes or no? Do you think Lambda's sentient? Do you think Lambda's sentient, Keith? Uh, uh, Lambda's the GP3 thing, right? Yeah. That, 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 that produces yes no. uh, reports saying, nah, well, it's, you know, it's... Yes it's, or no? Uh, no, not in, not in any, not, not in the, the, anything like the way we are, no. I mean, it's, it's can do a few things, do a few clever linguistic things that it reflect. I mean, a lot of what, a lot of our linguists, I don't think a lot, I think a lot of our linguistic productions are not much deeper than, 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 than it's, you know, we just, we just, uh, uh, following scripts that we have but yeah it's, they had a good uh, thing on the guardian uh podcast of you know they they, they got n not lambda but a similar you know one of these language learning things and they asked it um you know are you sentient and it gave a very articulate answer saying yes i am sentient and da, da, da. and then they said are you a werewolf and it said yes i am a werewolf <laughs> and gave this yeah, uh, no. anyway keith it's the final episode of the series i'm gonna have to go feed some children three minutes ago but i thought as a special treat i know lots of we had lots of letters of complaint that last time i stopped you doing your shakespeare and a lot of people thought that was very unkind i thought Given it's the final episode of the series, I thought it would be nice. Would you like to? Would you like to finish oh, the final? Yes, with your Shakespeare? please. Yes, please. Yeah? Oh, I really would. Yes, yes, please. Okay. Uh, okay, right. Well, uh, let me just.
just get ready. Just uh, oh, thank you so much, Philip. I, I really appreciate this. Okay, so okay, you deserve it. Go on. And you ready? Okay. 